to welcome Professor Spenta Wadia to chair the last session. Professor Wadia does not need any introduction to this community. Nonetheless, <laughs> Professor Wadia is a, a Professor Emeritus of ICTS, TIFR Bangalore, for which he's also the founding director. He, his research interest mainly lies in string theory and quantum gravity, where he has made many notable contributions. He has several awards to his name, uh, so with this, I would like to request Dr. Wadia to take us through the proceedings of the evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Please. Yeah. So good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, and welcome to the seventh session of the symposium dedicated to the memory of Kumar Chitre. I would like to thank the organizers for thinking of uh, putting this meeting together. And I'd like to begin uh, by saying a few words about Kumar myself. Uh, I first met him in 1967, uh, when I got a chance to visit Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. During my first year as a college student in St. Xavier's College. And he had just returned from Caltech that year. I still remember, I mean, very vividly, the twinkle in his eye as he spoke to me very encouragingly and left me with a concept I should think about. Entropy, he said, entropy, and especially think about how this idea applies to the universe. Oh, clearly, that I, I had no idea what entropy was, frankly, at that time. But over all these years, and even today, I am thinking about entropy as applied to various aspects of black hole physics. So years later, I was fortunate to become a faculty at the Tata Institute, and I found him to be a very supportive, helpful, and progressive senior colleague. He built up TIFR astrophysics in the areas of solar astrophysics and gravitational lensing, and the outstanding astrophysicist, Hormuz Antia, was his student. He also leaves behind a rich legacy at the DA Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences at the University of Mumbai. And with these few words for Kumar, I'd like to introduce Professor Roger Pendros before he begins his talk. <coughs> Professor Roger Pendros was born in Colchester, Essex, UK, almost, almost 90 years ago. He did his BSc in mathematics from University College London and his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 1958 in algebraic geometry under John Todd. He was drawn to questions in astrophysics by Denis Yama, and he was at Burbeck College in London when he wrote his seminal paper in 1965. In 1973, he was the Ruse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. And he continued to hold this until he became Emeritus Ruse Ball Professor of Mathematics in 1998, a position he holds till today. Roger Penrose was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Black hole solutions of Einstein's equations due to Schwarzschild and Kerr, and also the treatment of collapsing matter by Oppenheimer and Snyder was based on assuming that these solutions have symmetries. However, the discovery of quasars in the early 1960s led to a reconsideration of the phenomena of gravitational collapse. Penrose in early 1964 set out to investigate this question without the assumption of special symmetries. In his path-breaking paper in 1965, he developed mathematical methods using geometry and topology to establish the notion of a trapped surface that inevitably leads to a singularity. The conclusion uses minimal properties of Einstein's equations and positivity of local energy. The same methods were subsequently used by Hawking and Penrose to argue for the Big Bang singularity in cosmology. 
Penrose made a conceptual leap about how to approach the space of solutions of Einstein's equations, not by looking for exact solutions, but developing mathematical methods to make qualitative statements. In this respect, he reminds me of the great mathematician, Henri Poincare, who developed mathematical methods to make qualitative statements about the solution space of complicated differential equations of classical mechanics. He has made many other seminal and imaginative contributions to mathematical physics and its communication. Take for instance, the Penrose diagram of a black hole. It has become part of our thought process in relativity, like Feynman diagrams in quantum field theory. There are many other things I can talk about, like twisters, the energetics of the ergosphere of a rotating black hole, Penrose stylings that underlie quasicrystals, etc. But I do not want to take away the time allocated to this session from Roger's time. Just to conclude, Roger is a great communicator, and I highly recommend his more recent book, The Road to Reality, for everybody to read. It's such a pleasure to read that book. So in conclusion, just to mention, Roger is a fellow of the Royal Society of London and a foreign associate of the United States National Academy of Sciences. He has many honors and awards, but I'll just mention a few. He was awarded the Science Book Prize for his book, Emperor's New Mind. The other prizes include the Adams Prize of Cambridge University, a very early one. The Wolf Foundation Prize for Physics, jointly with Stephen Hawking for their understanding of the universe. The Danny Heinemann Prize of the American Physical Society and nearer to now, the, the Morgan Medal of the London Mathematical Society in 2004 and the Copley Medal of the Royal Society in 2005, and of course the Nobel Prize in 2020. With these few words, I would like to invite Roger Penrose to deliver his talk. Roger. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's also a great honor for me to be able to pay my respects to Kumar Chitri, who I never worked with him, but on the other hand, whenever I went to India, he was a great, uh, companion and we talked a lot and I remember particularly in I can't remember the exact date but something like 1987 when I came with my uh, young fiance and she was finding India rather overwhelming and spent a night in a mosquito ridden room and uh, when we arrived this would have been at the Tata Institute I think and uh, Chitri uh, joined us and he was so uh, made, made us feel so at home, particularly my wife, who was able to <laughs> calm her down and uh, we really had a wonderful time. And I think it illustrated how, how, was he, how great he was at rela relating to people and making them feel comfortable and talking to, to them about science or other things about life. And I really found him a, a tremendous inspiration and finding my visits to India to be doubly uh, satisfactory and interesting and uh, exciting. Let me talk about a particular, I, I want to start my talk on gravitational lensing because that, this is a, a thing I can relate to Kumar about, although that most of the things I talk about were not so specifically to do with him, but the gravitational lensing is something he was particularly interested in. So let me start by that to begin with. And this is, a, you can see we are the earth at the Earth looking at a distant star and the light bending by the sun. This was one of the, it was the uh, thing, the prediction of Einstein's theory, which was convincingly demonstrated and made an Einstein general relativity something people began, began to take seriously at this point. The thing I want to talk about particularly is the effect on the background sky. And here you see the bending of the light means that the, you see here we have, uh, maybe a circular pattern. Imagine you had a circular pattern of stars and that if the sun was not there, they would look circular. But as the displacement outwards gets less and less, the further away you get from the sun, it means that the, I mean, the bending of the light means it looks further out than, than the image does, but, but it's less further out uh, uh, <clears throat> at the far point than in the near point, And so it becomes elliptical. 
So the shapes become distorted, circles become elliptical. And this is a feature of the vile curvature of space time. So this is the particular feature which I want to discuss. Um, the curvature of space time naturally splits into two. I, I should say that, that I became, became interested in general relativity partly because of my relationship with Dennis Sharma that was mentioned already. And uh, uh, he got me interested in physics when I was doing pure mathematics, really algebraic geometry. But I, I, I love the physics and particularly Einstein general theory of relativity. But I remember I had ways of looking at tensors using, using drawing little diagrams and things like that. But I learned about two component spinners and I thought, how on earth does that make any sense? And I puzzled about it for a long time until I went to a course of lectures by Dirac in quantum mechanics where he deviated from the normal a series of lectures and talked about two component spinners and made it absolutely clear to me. Then I went and started to translate uh, the tensor formalism of general relativity into two spinners. And it became very clear that you have these two kinds of curvature. The curvature, which is the Ricci curvature is according to Einstein's theory directly determined by the matter distribution, which what's left is the vial curvature, that's the distortion part, which we would have seen in the previous picture here, the fact that you have uh, circular shapes become elliptical, so it's, it's a distortion. And this distortion is the vial curvature, it's the conformal curvature, and that's an play an important role in what I want to say later. But the vial curvature describes the free gravitational field. It's a bit like Maxwell's equations where you have the source and you have the field itself. The, the charge current vector is the source and the field uh, is the electromagnetic field tensor, but there are different orders of derivative. Whereas in general relativity, the source and the field are at the same order of derivative. So you see the, the, uh, the source playing one form curvature and the, the uh, gravita free gravitational field forming the other. And the vial curvature is really the free gravitational field. So that point of view was something I really picked up thinking about gravitational lensing. And let me move on. I'm just going to talk mainly about four dimensional geometry. So you have to get used to that. And you, therefore, I'm seeing four spatial axes, four, three spatial axes and one time axis. But the more important thing are, are the light rays. So I have to use this. Uh, if, you, if you're using, say, seconds for your time, then it's a good thing to use something like uh, light seconds, in other words, whatever it is, 380,000. Uh, no, I get my figures wrong. Um, anyway, a long, a long distance for your light second. And uh, it, it, that's convenient because then your light rays, look at it, you can draw nice pictures. That's the basic point. And I like to draw nice pictures. That's the important feature. Okay, the light cone, that's the, the most important feature of the geometry. We'll come back to that later. But I want to say, particularly, you imagine your space time to have these cones. Of course, because your space is four dimensional, you always have to imagine there's an extra dimension. So the drawing them as cones like this is, is not quite honest because you're only looking at two spatial dimensions where you really have to have three. So you've got to bear that in mind all the time. And you bear in mind also that light rays follow uh, the history of a photon will be along the light rays, tangent to the cone all the time. Whereas um, material particles, finite mass particles, will be within the cone. And so you'll have curves representing GD6, not necessarily G6, could be uh, curves, time like curves within, and the, within the cones. And this gives you the causal structures to space time, which is given by the light cones. Now, one feature I want to mention, particularly if you have a well, I should call these really null cones. The null cones are at each point that's in the tangent space. The light cone, in a sense, is really the, the locus of the null geodesics through a point. And the point I want to make is that they can do funny things. At the back, you notice a, a crossing region and cuspidal region like this. So the natural feature, when you have a lot of curvature, conformal curvature, you will get uh, unpleasant looking features like this. So. And there you have another picture where they start to cross over. The trick is not to worry about that too much. When they start crossing over, you, you forget about what happens on the inside. 
This next picture is a picture of a Oppenheimer Snyder gravitational collapse, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, this was in 19, uh, just before the war, um, 1939, when, when they studied a dust cloud collapsing and spherically symmetrical. And so the fact that all the matter, you see the bottom, I should explain my pictures are normally with time going up the picture so that we have a collapsing material, which in Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Snyder picture was a dust cloud. Since it had no pressure and everything was focused towards the central point, it's not at all surprising that you get infinity for the density, because where does it go? I mean, it's falling inwards, nothing to stop it. And since all the matter is focused into this one central point, the density is, is bound to become infinite. Now, this may be an artifact, and I think a lot of people did think it was an artifact. And uh, I remember becoming interested in it, particularly when I started a fellowship at Cambridge, at Cambridge, St. John's College, Cambridge. And I attended a lecture given by David Finkelstein that Dennis Sharma had told me about. And he was describing mainly the, what I'm using in this picture here, the upper part of the picture, you see this cylindrical thing, which represents the history of the uh, event horizon which is really where the cones become tangent to this, uh, well, you might just, the time vector field is pointing upwards. And so it becomes, I mean, it's time-like out here, but when you get inside, uh, it becomes space-like and it's null just on the horizon. And the main point is the cones have become tangent there. So once you've fallen through, you can't get out again because the, uh, the world lines are all pointing through into the center. Now, of course, the question was, and certainly as was mentioned in the introduction, you have this uh, in, in the early 1960s, people started to see these curious phenomena, which seemed to be the quasars, which we now call them quasars, quasi-stellar objects, which had uh, in intensities of more than a galact uh, an entire galaxy, and yet they seem to be pretty small, um, concentrated in a region from the uh, variations in, 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 in brightness, you could see they, had, they couldn't be that big. They had to be smaller than the solar system, something like that. And so people were beginning to talk, particularly Hoyle and Fowler, I remember, uh, speculating on whether these might be collapsed features, but where it's complicated and not uh, symmetrical, and you might get uh, radiation coming out from uh, situations like that. But the question arose, was this symmetrical collapse generic uh, or, or not? And do these the presence of features like this cause problems? Um, and I began to think about it. And this is the picture taken from the paper that was referred to in the introduction, which seems to have won me a Nobel Prize, which was in 19, well, I did the work in 1964 and I gave a talk at King's College, uh, I remember, the great uh, geometrical relativist John L. Singh was, happened to be there, and I was very flattered that he was attending my talk. Um, <clears throat> despite what the movie says, Stephen Hawking was not present, but I did give this talk and uh, Dennis Sharma heard about it and he suggested I give a repeat in Cambridge. The feature I want to illustrate here is, first of all, we have an initial surface, which is a space-like surface, which you imagine is non-compact, it could go out to infinity like this. You're only looking at a local region within this uh, initial surface. <clears throat> the matter collapses inwards. And at a certain point, illustrated by this ring in the middle, this is what I call the trapped surface. And you can see that the local future of that ring is bounded, this shaded region would be the future of that ring, uh, where you can get to from time-like curves and I would look at the boundary of that region. And the trapped surface meant that the rays start to converge inwards at that point. This more specifically, uh, it sees a surface and not just, you see it looks like a ring, but of course that's because I've not drawn enough dimensions, but you have to imagine there's an extra dimension that's really a surface. And if you have a surface, it might be concave on one side and then the a flash of light over that surface would you would expect it to converge but on the other side, you'd expect it to diverge. What's particular about a trapped surface is it converges on both sides. There's nothing actually strange about that. It may seem strange at first, nothing really strange, 
because if you have, say, two points in space time and look at their past light cones, their intersection will locally be trapped because the light rays which come out from a flash of light on that surface would be focused either to P or Q and therefore converging on both sides. What's peculiar about a trapped surface is not that the light rays are focusing on both sides, but it is that and compact at the same time. So here you have a surface which is not compact, so it's not surprising. But if it closes up, then you're in trouble. And that was what I was able to use, use that feature and derive a fact that you have to have a contract region here. And I won't go into the details of that. But it did depend upon the fact that when you have rays that start by converging inwards, and if they're hypersurface orthogonal, that really means they're in boundary locally to a, surf, to a, a four volume. As they focus inwards, they continue inwards unless the energy density becomes negative. So assume the energy density is never negative, or at least the flux across the light rays is never negative. And then it's really this effect due to Russia Dury. So we go back to India again. Um, this is the null version of this effect. And you can show that the light rays then must eventually converge. And using uh, topological ideas, you can show that there's a contradiction. Um, people often used to worry whether you would get a trapped surface, maybe things go wrong before that. But it seemed pretty clear, certainly after many discussions with uh, Charlie Misner, I remember, which, who was an important figure in this discussion, because uh, he persuaded me that it can't be a real problem. And people used to talk about stars mainly, and this is where, of course, Chandra Selikar's work with the white dwarfs, and if they got too massive, then you would have a uh, problem making them stable. And but it was a feature which would apply not just to stars, but you have all collections of stars. You might imagine many, many stars. And if they get reasonably close together, you don't need to have all that many stars all that close together. They don't have to intersect or anything like that. And you can see, not necessarily a trapped surface. It's easier to think of the focusing point. You think of point in space time. And as the future light cone of that point, I don't know if my cursor is being seen here. I'm having trouble seeing it myself. Here we go. The future light cone of that point, the point has got off the picture somehow. And the light rays, as they cross the stars, become, and if you have enough stars, they'll begin to refocus. And then this, this, yes, here we have a point there. And the light rays from that point begin to refocus because of the number of stars they encounter. And the star, the density doesn't have to be large or anything at all, and you will get this reconverging light cone. That's just as good as a trapped surface. In that condition, the theorem just works just as well. Okay, well, um, Stephen Hawking got involved with this. Let, let me just backtrack a little bit from my picture here. Stephen Hawking uh, heard about my talk from Dennis Sharma, and he then started to develop my techniques and using the arguments to apply to the Big Bang, as well as to a local collapse. He, did, he picked up them very quickly and he used the same theorem as mine in the reverse direction of time to show that in certain circumstances you would generically get a, uh, 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 <clears throat> for a collapsing universe, if you like, if you imagine it could perhaps bounce somehow and come out again without being singular, this is won't work under very general circumstances. And, and after he, he generalized these techniques and uh, applied them to general relativity, uh, to cosmology. And, uh, and then we got together and, and produced a theorem which encompassed pretty well all the things we had before. Uh, so it is a very general result. Now, I want to talk about quantum mechanics and general relativity because people used to think, well, you've got these singularities. In fact, that was really, well, I proved not the fact, that, although the Nobel Prize was for black holes, it's another condition that you have to, the mere fact that you get a singularity doesn't mean you have a black hole because you had to show something which is still unproved as far as I'm aware, this thing called cosmic censorship, that can you get naked singularities? I used to puzzle, it didn't seem to me completely obvious that you wouldn't get naked singularities under general circumstances. I got gradually convinced that they weren't the case and the cosmic censorship in some form is probably true, but uh, it's not a rigorous theorem at the moment, as far as I'm aware. So we still don't know that naked singularities don't think don't occur. I think it's most unlikely that they do, 
um, and you can produce many um, argue, sort of hand-waving arguments to show that it's unlikely. Anyway, let me continue with this. What do you do with the singularities? Well, the normal thing people would say, well, it's you have to bring quantum mechanics into it because classical general relativity says you get singular, the densities become infinite, therefore the curvatures become infinite. Well, when you get cur radii of curvature, which are something like the Planck distance, so the radius of curvature becomes 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, that's ridiculously tiny then you've really got to worry about quantum mechanics. So perhaps you don't really have singularities, but some quantum gravity effect. So is it to do with quantum gravity? And this is the point I want to raise. So we are trying to bring quantum mechanics and gravity together and produce a theory which is, explains away the singularities in some, and this would apply, so the argument goes, not just the singularities in black holes, which we can't really get at because they're in the black holes, maybe when Hawking evaporation takes over, you might have some effect that you could see ultimately. But the real argument would perhaps be to the Big Bang. And this certainly was what Dennis Sharma began to um, persuade people about. And so you need a theory which combines general relativity with quantum mechanics. Uh, well, we don't have a good theory. There are all sorts of ideas, string theory, loops, foams, things like this. Whatever one might think of any of these particular theories, they're certainly very far from any observation, observational consequences. But so uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about something else. The main reason I'm not going to talk about that is that I don't think that it solves the problem. And the main reason I don't think it solves the problem, well, what is the problem? The problem has to be how we deal with the Big Bang, because, okay, we, we may deal with the singularities in some way, but the more immediate problem is how do we deal with the Big Bang? And the trouble I have always had, well, always, for certainly for a long time, is that the vial curvature, and this is the gravitational degrees of freedom, seem to go to zero at the Big Bang, or close to zero, they seem to be strongly, I'll say a little more about that in a minute, uh, whereas in the singularities in in black holes, the expectation is that the vial curvature violently goes to infinity. So what kind of a quantum gravity theory is it that produces those so completely different answers in these two different situations? And this was a very crucial um, feature for me to worry about. Sorry, I keep moving it the wrong way. Um, here I have... Uh, looking at it from a rather different perspective. The point of view I'm thinking about is not really so much um, what this theory in the middle is, that is to say, what is the mysterious quantum gravity which relates these two theories, but what are the problems of the two subjects? All right, we see this problem in general relativity is the singularities, but there is a problem in quantum mechanics and this problem, in my view, the main problem in quantum mechanics, I mean, you get divergences, all sorts of things like that, but the main problem of quantum mechanics is the measurement problem. And so I have at the top a cartoon of a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. It's not the usual way one thinks about it, but you see the cat is on one side dead and on the other side alive. And this is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. I will come to this, back to this briefly at the end of the talk. This is not my talk today. There's a lot can be said about this. And I think that general relativity really is the thing which answers the question of the measurement issue in quantum mechanics. But that's not what I want to talk about here. Although, as I say, we'll come back to it. But the main thing I will talk about is the issue of the singularities in general relativity. And okay, I said the singularities in general relativity. What about the Big Bang then? Well, this is a cartoon of our current view of the universe. Well, I'll come back to what happens right in the Big Bang in a, shortly, but uh, the main thing is that we see this expansion. According to Einstein's general relativity, uh, it gradually slows down and then starts to accelerate from the observations at the turn of the century that of the distant supernovae stars with these two groups, notice that they seem to indicate there's an accelerated expansion, which to me is simply an evidence that there is a cosmological constant in Einstein's equations. I remember, I, I always got very puzzled by people saying there's this mysterious dark energy going around, who knows what it is. 
when I used to go to conferences and people would say at the end of the conference, well, we don't yet know whether there's where there is a cos cosmological constant in Einstein's equations or not. Perhaps by the next conference, we will know. And uh, when people found this evidence, they stopped talking so much about the cosmological constant and thinking about it might be something else. Of course, it might be something else. But to me, it was a great re revelation because I had wrong reasons for believing it should be zero. And I think it was Jerry Ostreicher who persuaded me that it was not just the supernovae, it seemed to indicate that there was this accelerating expansion. But when you introduce this term, it really did make a lot of things work so much better. And I became convinced, OK, let's change, shift my point of view and take the cosmological constant seriously. But I do want to talk just initially about what most cosmologists seem to think about the Big Bang, a little bit more about this picture. Namely, you should have a good look at the Big, big, big Bang a lot more closely and what you would see would be this inflationary phase. So current theory takes inflation seriously. I could never take it seriously because it, it really will have, I'll mention a problem I have about it in a moment, but uh, there were some various reasons, some which are more convincing with others. I think that getting rid of the monopoles I never found very persuasive because you had a theory which had the monopoles in the first place. Uh, uh, the other argument that people often, well, there's, the main argument is the scale invariance of the um, microwave background, which I'll mention if I have time at the end. If you don't have inflation, you've got a problem about why are these um, uh, temperature variations in the microwave background have this very curious scale invariance, which seems to indicate some kind of exponential expansion as an origin for it. But the, one of the other arguments that people use is, okay, the Big Bang could have been very complicated and maybe all sorts of wild vial curvature, whatever you like, but then the inflationary phase would have smoothed it all out as smooth as nice, and then we have this very smooth looking Big Bang that we seem to experience. I never believed that argument for the following reason. Okay, let's turn the universe upside down. All these equations, including the inflaton field and everything, are symmetrics in time. So if you have a, an expanding universe as a solution, then you have a collapsing one. But you would expect to have irregularities. And in a collapsing situation, these irregularities would build up. You expect things to form. Certainly, as the universe gets very, very concentrated, you get black holes formed. These black holes will collide with each other. A great mess of complicated singularities will congeal together. And it won't look anything like that, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong battle. It'll look much more like that. You'll get these black hole singularities congealing with each other, violently, violently diverging vial curvature, completely unlike what, what we saw in the Big Bang. And because of the time symmetry of the equations involved, why was not the, this the case in the beginning? In fact, you can work out how unlikely the situation that we seem to see, namely that, as opposed to this, I remember Don Page doing a calculation for me. See how many black holes are we? Are, do we see? I mean, how many um, black holes do we expect to see in our universe, judging from the galaxy that we see within our particle horizon and so on? And Don Page came up with a figure of an entropy of something like 10 to the power, sorry, an entropy of something like 10 to the power 123. I think with the dark matter, it's something like 10 to the power 124. So this, since the entropy is a logarithm of a probability, the probability of finding something nice and smooth like this, as opposed to what the more likely situation would be this, is something like one part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power 124. So, Various religious people said, well, look, I proved religion because this tells you that the, there must be a God who, uh, that was not my view. I think there must be some other explanation. I and my toyed a long time with the idea that there must be some very, very curious kind of quantum gravity, which is very asymmetrical in time. And then I sort of gave up on that and said, well, maybe you just postulate for some reason unknown that the singularities in the future have to, are allowed to have wildly diverging vial curvature is the generic case, whereas for some reason unknown, the Big Bang has to have 
a vanishing vial curvature, which was my vial curvature hypothesis, simply a hypothesis with no... Uh, well, let me talk a little bit more about that. You see, it's very remarkable, not just for the reason I mentioned, but also for the following. Think about the, f the top three boxes here. Imagine a gas in a box and you go from left to right. Unlike my other pictures where time goes up here, time is going from left to right. Imagine, imagine in this box, we have a smaller box where you have the, all the gas, which is collected. Then you open the box up and the gas spreads out through the box. This represents time increasing from left to right, entropy increasing from left to right. Okay, let's imagine now a different situation, a galactic scale box full of stars, and these stars are now gravitating. They will tend to clump because of the universally attractive uh, feature of gravitation. They will start to clump and they will produce black holes. So the entropy is still going up and up, time going from left to right, but the picture looks completely different. What we see is a combination of bottom left and top right. It's not just that the entropy was low in the early universe, it's low just in gravity. Very, very odd. Why is it that's so curiously imbalanced with regard to gravity? It's even more striking because when we think of, well, we go back to whatever it is, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, just when the time for the radiation can escape out. Uh, and this is the, I think the original, was it the, the Kobe satellite? I think when they, uh, it looked at the microwave background and you see the, this is the, the, uh, the intensity for different um, frequencies, frequency going up here horizontally. And you see this wonderful Planck curve. The, these are error bars. And we notice that the error bars are exaggerated by a factor of 500. So they hug the incline, even right at the end, it still hugs the, edline, the, the, the incline, right through the center of the incline. It's an amazingly uh, accurate Planck curve. It's, it's, um, why is it such an accurate Planck curve? Well, it's because, so we see that what you have is thermal equilibrium. So it's not just that when you go back and back and back in time where the entropy seems to come down and down and down and down and down, and down till you get a maximum. It seems to be most peculiar like that. It's a very strange argument. People might say, well, if the universe was much smaller in those days, maybe no, no, that doesn't work. That's not the explanation. It's just very peculiar that the radiation, as in the day, uh, picture I just had previously, where we see the... Uh, um, not just a gas in a box, but if you have a, oh dear, I'm going the wrong way. I never get the hang of these pictures, these. <laughs> not just a gas in the box, but when you think of radiation and the gas, the box, it's still maximum entropy. It's just gravity, which is not. Somehow gravity is singled out as being very peculiar. Okay. Now I want to take a different perspective on the whole subject. The perspective is the conformal perspective. So I want to say it's important to look at space-time with regard to the conformal structure. This picture is a nice, wonderful picture due to M.C. Escher. It's the first of his circle limits. I think he, he uh, thought that this was rather primitive, this one, because it's, uh, his, his later ones were much more ingenious in many ways. But this illustrates the geometry very nicely. This is a geometry of the hyperbolic plane, and it's the... the uh, well, the, <clears throat> the Beltrami, Poincaré, Beltrami was the first, if you like, people used to call it the Poincaré disc. Um, and you see the hyperbolic geometry squashed up conformally into this nice disc. And these fish creatures have circular eyes to illustrate the fact that it's conformal. The conformal squashing of the eyes, they remain circles right as close as, I've actually seen the original of this picture and extraordinarily well done, how, how precisely it's right up to the edge. You can't see it so well in this, this reproduction here, but it, it is extremely accurately done. And uh, the conformal picture tells you that you could talk about infinity. And I was really very fond of that idea and could make use of it in all sorts of ways in relativity theory, usually to do with radiation theory. Um, but let me just go back to the light cone and say 
how do you represent the geometry of space time? Well, it's not just the light cones, but you have to have these surfaces here, which are the surfaces of equal time from the origin. So you have the cone represents nine out of the 10 components. It's actually the nine ratios, the nine independent ratios of the 10 components of the metric. The 10th component is the crowding of these surfaces. What are the surfaces? Where they represent, if you have, hello? Sorry, is that all right? We have two particles going through this origin point at different speeds, if you like, rel great relative speed, near the speed of light, but not quite the speed of light. And as these surfaces intersect, as these uh, two particles intersect these surfaces, let's suppose they're identical particles, then these surfaces represent the ticks of the clocks. And the ticks of the clocks, well, I'm just using Einstein's uh, the two most famous formulae of 20th century physics, e equals mc squared, of course, e equals h nu, Max Planck's formula, put the two together. The first, Einstein tells you L and G and mass are equivalent. Planck tells you energy and frequency are equivalent, therefore mass and frequency are equivalent. So these surfaces are telling you that clocks are, sorry, particles are wonderful clocks. They're very, very precise clocks. And this gives you nuclear and atomic clocks. Uh, uh, scaling the things down adequately so you can actually see them properly. But it's the scaling that you get from the mass of particles. But if you don't have mass, then you don't need the surfaces. So if you're talking about photons, and even if you're talking about Maxwell's equations, you see Maxwell's equations, that's, if you like, the, uh, the, the, uh, the photons, if you think of them as, as uh, particles, Classical particles, they just zip along with the speed of light. But if you think of it as quantum particles, they are really solutions of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations are conformally invariant. So you see that it's just the light cones. The conformal structure is the light cones. That's the point I'm trying to make, is that in general relativity, conformal geometry is more primitive than the metric geometry. It just means you have the geometry of massless things, of photons, if you like, or any part, any mass, even gravitational radiation, basically follows the light rays and is in a certain sense conformally invariant. I won't go into the details of that. But so it's the light cones. Now, what I'm going to do here is that trick, the Escher trick, if you like, as applied to infinity. When you have a cosmological constant, this is an important factor here, and it was important for me to realize and take seriously the cosmological constant, because that means that the future infinity is not now anymore, it's space-like. And when it's space-like, it's like a time. It's time infinity, but it's like a time. And, and the photons, if you like, go and they meet that time. And you might wonder what happens to them as they go beyond. I did wonder about that, that was a question. Um, but that's the, this is the picture of the universe. And there's a wonderful theorem by Helmut Friedrich, which tells you in very, very general circumstances, as long as you have massless sources and you don't have things like black holes, if you've got rid of them somehow, then <clears throat> you will have a nice space-like boundary in the future. Now, what about the Big Bang? Now, this was Paul Todd, my graduate student at the time, had a better way of looking at it than saying the Val curvature hypothesis. He said, why don't you just say that the Big Bang stretched out is a nice smooth surface. And that seemed to be a much nicer way of doing it. And I agree with that. So let's do it that way. You can stretch out the Big Bang, you can squash down infinity. But it's also that you see you can continue the infinity. The usual picture is that you could, you don't imagine there's anything beyond it, but you could in principle continue. And it's very useful to do your equations. You can just imagine this is part of a surface which keeps on going. In the same way you can imagine the past, you could, you could imagine it keeps on going, and it's a nice way to talk about your equations. That's all it is, it's a trick. But then I remember worrying about this one point, is it just a trick or could it be more than a trick? You see, when you stretch out in the Big Bang, the Big Bang is very, very hot and very dense. The, the, con the conjugate variables to the space and time are the, uh, momentum and the energy, and they go the other way around. So when you stretch out space and time, you squash down energy and momentum. So your, your temperature, which is enormously high, when you stretch it out, 
it becomes colder. The opposite thing with the remote future is that when you squash infinity down, the density becomes much bigger and the temperature becomes much bigger. So they actually begin to look very much like each other. So I thought they did look very much like each other. Maybe in some sense they are like each other. I don't want to join them out together. This gives you horrible problems with time closed like time, as time like curves. But if you imagine that we are, Big Bang was the continuation of the remote future or previous eon, I'm calling it, that would be, maybe make sense. It's a radical idea. And I certainly, I spent a lot of time giving lectures on this and thinking, well, nobody will ever prove me wrong. So I can talk on indefinitely on the subject. But then I began worrying about, well, I should come back to the inflation point. You can't have inflation in this picture because it actually it, it, it spoils the join. But however, you do have an exponential expansion. You see in the previous eon, the, uh, you have this exponential expansion here, which sort of looks like an inflationary phase. So maybe you don't need inflation because the fact that you have the scale invariance uh, as a, 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 a motivation for inflation, you can do it a different way. That the scale invariance comes from the exponential expansion. Signals can get across as long as they're massless. So you can imagine photons getting across, provided the frequency is sufficiently low, maybe magnetic fields and things like that could get across. Otherwise they have trouble on the other side, they scatter and, and don't get very far. Gravitational signals might get across. So this is an important factor. What about gravitational signals? Well, I began to think about it. What about collisions between supermassive black holes? Here I'm having the, the, the crossover from one eon to the next is this surface in the middle. And I'm imagining this is us at the top looking back. And this is a stretched out Big Bang. And do we see possibly signals from gravitational waves coming from the collisions between supermassive black holes. Now, you have to wait a long time for this to happen, but in a single cluster of galaxies, the clusters don't be, you have this exponential expansion, so the superclusters will disperse, but the clusters remain more or less bound. And so that there will be several uh, uh, collisions between supermassive black holes in a single cluster. So you might see several of these. They would look at the bottom picture I've drawn rather deliberately, rather faintly, the sort of thing you see, you see these rings, which would be the evidence of these gravitational wave signals, according to the theory. And if you see several of these collisions, you might see concentric rings. So that was the test. And uh, there as people started to look at these things, but didn't see anything until uh, my colleague, Armenian colleague, Vahe Gurzijan had a look. I wanted to show you this picture. This was from the uh, I think the WMAP data, and he, the, the, the equatorial region is removed, that's the galactic plane, and so the, in order to get rid of the galaxy, that's removed from the picture. But you see this, these regions of these rings, and I forget, you probably see the numbers there, I, I can't see them myself, but um, the test that I had here uh, was that you, consider that you twist the sky, you do the same test for more and more twists of the sky. The twist is uh, with a, an axis, vertical axis in the picture, and the twist increases as you go from top to bottom. And so this means circles become elliptical shapes. So you twist the sky, do the same test on the twisted sky, and see the more and more you twist, the number of the signals drops dramatically. So with a substantial trick, you see hardly any of them. And they, they drop by a factor of three, even with a tiny, tiny little twist. So this seemed to me a certain amount of evidence that this, these signals were right. Uh, a Polish group did a different analysis. Um, I won't talk about that for the moment, but I will talk about this, which is the centers. This is now the Planck data. The previous one was the WMAP data. This is the Planck data. And I wanted to point out that these rings were singled out because of the variance being low, not because they were warmer or cooler, but the temperature variation around the ring was less than usual. And this would be an expectation from the theory. Now, the reason I'm saying that 
is that you see a clumping in the sky, which is very, very strange. If the, if the whole sky was that uniform, whatever the reason, whatever the reason, why do you get this clumping? Now the picture is, in uh, my scheme, is that the clumping is because there really are some very big super duper cluster regions where, let's look at the top lot. These are blue in color. It's always backwards, you see, because blue means cooler in the, in the color coding and red means warmer, which of course is the wrong way around. Uh, blue means red shifted and red means blue shifted. The blue ones are also the nearer ones. It's very confusing because what well, you see here, this is us up here looking back. This is the crossover surface. Here we have uh, signals coming from a world line of a supermassive black hole, say. And if this is closer to us, then we're seeing the waves going away from us. So the more closer ones are the ones which will be redshifted. The further ones are the ones which will be blue shifted. So it's the wrong way around from what we expect. And so it's but doubly the wrong way around. So it's the right way around again. In other words, the red ones are the distant ones and the blue ones are the nearer ones. When I say nearer, I mean within our particle horizon. When I say more distant, they are outside our particle horizon. You can still see it because our light cone continues out, outwards and outwards to beyond the um, crossover to one we, what we normally call our particle horizon. So you can actually see things outside the particle horizon. So that's one of the right, great powers of this. If it's, if it's right, then we can see things outside the particle horizon. But the point I want to mention here, which is remarkable, is that the clustering is in the color and therefore, according to the theory, in the distance. So it really is a space, spatial clustering. This is also a spatial clustering. These are sort of intermediate greenish ones. Um, if this is not the explanation, I need another explanation. But it is remarkable that it does seem to tie in if we have allowed for a certain amount of clustering, which is not part of normal theory. Okay, what about the other feature? This is the Hawking evaporation of a supermassive black hole. And this is, uh, you might have to rate something like 10 to the 100 years, a Google years for some of the bigger ones. And here, according to Hawking evaporation, they all the radiation goes out and goes out and it goes out and disappears with a pop or something like this. This I should mention this one little point which people worry about, which is the, um, people worry about uh, the pot hawking evaporation and does it, do you lose information? And uh, I always thought this was a, I could never see how you could get around losing information because you just draw the conformal diagram. And if this black hole is big enough, you could, you could fall into the black hole and play many, many games of cards and have all sorts of pieces of information in here. And that can't be repeated outside without violating the no cloning theory. So you, you've jolly well got to lose information. And I could never understand why people worried about trying to bring it back, particularly because in my view, um, and this is the one point I wanted to make about the, the other side here. You see, you can lose information in ordinary quantum mechanics because whenever you make a measurement, you lose information. But people try to think, oh, well, nevertheless, it's somehow unitary. But with the, Gravitational being so important in black holes, the, the non-unitariness of the measurement process seems to me to be a predominant feature. And so the fact that you lose information is quite consistent with what I would expect. I didn't want to stress that point particularly. The last thing I do want to say, however, is this question of the Hawking points. Do you see something about the Hawking evaporation? Now, in this, this is the picture from the paper written by Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nurovsky, Daniel Ann, two Poles and, and a South, uh, South Korean who works in New York now. And uh, this is the analysis, which is now published, I think um, getting on for almost a year by now in the uh, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. This is the one picture we have in the, pic in the, in the article. Horizontal line at the bottom is the crossover surface. So this is the previous eon, this is our eon. 
This is the decoupling or last scattering. It doesn't make much difference. Surface here. Here is a Hawking. Here we have a galactic cluster, which has become a black hole, a supermassive black hole. It sits around for well, however long it is, 10 to the 103 years or something. And finally, it disappears. But you see all the radiation, it takes so long to evaporate away that all the radiation is concentrated in a tiny point. If you remember the, the, the uh, Escher picture I showed you and how those fish get so quashed into the, into the edge, all the radiation, because the light, you know, the light cones are just squashed in there, they don't get very far. You may think of the radiation seeping way out to very, very long distances, the speed of light, but the speed of light is nothing because the expansion is going so greatly that it's when you squash it down, it's all squashed into a little point. So Hawking radiation or no Hawking radiation, all the energy would be squashed into that point. And so that you take a, and, and you can do integrals around it. You see, it's supposed to be smooth everywhere else. So the transition from one eon to the next is very smooth and you get this smoothness everywhere except at the Hawking points. And these will be virtually singular points on the other side with the curvature. People, people would ask where the entropy goes. Where does the entropy in the universe go? It's in the black holes. It's in black hole radiation. Where did it all go? It gets squashed into those points. When they come out on the other side, that is a less than a Planck scale. So it gets destroyed. So we, I'm certainly allowing the information to be destroyed there. However, the energy of that does not get destroyed. And you can see from the integrals, it must not be. So you get this, this huge energetic point spread out, spread out, spread out to about, well, how big is that? That's about four degrees across the sky. At the top, we have a kind of contour of it. With, it, it scatters and scatters and scatters. The photons don't escape because of all this wonderful work that my predecessor uh, and Nobel Prize, Jim Peebles and his company, have a wonderful detailed work of what happens in this region up to the last scattering or decoupling. And then finally it escapes. But by the time it escapes, it's more or less Gaussian. And you see this sort of more or less Gaussian distribution. And uh, um, that is apparently what you see. What is that? Well, it's about 10 times, the, sorry, it's about eight times the diameter of the full moon. So you would have spots in the sky where the increase in the background temperature is something like about 30 fold, I think, for the strongest ones. And so you expect to see these spots in the sky. Do you see them? Well, according to the analysis that's Christoph Meisner technique he introduced and how Daniel Land looking in detail at the, um, the Planck data and then the WMAP data, and we seem to see these points in the sky. The confidence level that they're there, according to the analysis, is about 99.98% confidence, which is much stronger than the, I should say that the, the Polish school also looked at the, the rings that I mentioned before using a completely different analysis and they found a 99.4% confidence level. This is a much stronger confidence level. Where are these points? Well, the, there's not, the analysis doesn't tell you where they are, it just tells you they're there. But Daniel had another way of looking and he found several such points. I'm not so sure you can trust all of them. However, the five strongest ones in the Planck data are seen also in the WMAP data in exactly the same places. So I would trust all those. There's a sixth one in the WMAP data, which if you look back in the Planck data, you see that's there too. The sixth one, I think is the sixth strongest one in the Planck data, in the WMAP data, it was also in the Planck data. So those six points I would consider to be pretty good evidence for Hawking points. So um, I think I'll leave that with you and I'd be very glad to answer questions on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Roger. Let's uh, give unmute and give Roger a big hand. Uh, uh, Roger, there have been an enormous number of questions uh, in the chat box. Okay. Now the, <laughs> the organizers have told me that I think we don't have time uh, enough to answer even a few of them uh, because there's just so many. So they have decided to send you those questions after, you know, 
towards the end of the day. Well, I hope they select them because I, I don't think I can answer. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I, I definitely, they will select, I hope. If you could they are listening to you. The 10 most interesting questions, say. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, so maybe there are two of them here, which I think uh, I can ask you. I mean, I can yeah. read them out. Uh, yeah. So one question is, and I don't know who has asked this question, uh, but let me ask it anyway. Uh, what should be the measure of gravitational entropy? Can we define it in terms of geometrical quantities, even when a black hole is not present? That's the question. I think that the trouble with this, you see people often worry about this and I agree. And, and in fact, wrong reasons have been attributed to me saying it's something like the square of the round curvature. That's not, I've never said that. It's certainly not that. Um, I don't know a good measure. You see, the trouble with entropy when applied to stars, I mean, gra gravity is it's, if it's, I mean, you've got the individual stars, but then you've got the stars among themselves and they start to spiral in and so on. Whereas if it was gas, then you see you can, you, you're talking about molecules and you don't see them. And so um, you talk about averages, but when you're talking about stars, you can see the individual stars. So it's not really, Maybe you could imagine them smeared out and talking about an entropy of a star distribution. I have never tried to do that. I mean, you know, just imagine the star smeared out to a sort of gas-like quantity, and then you could maybe attribute a gravitational entropy there. I, I don't know of a measure of entropy. All I've done is take the Hawking, uh, Bekenstein-Hawking formula, and it's such an extreme measure in the sense that it gives you quite reasonably, I think, a very, very large entropy because black holes are extraordinarily irreversible. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I think from many, many reasonings, you can say this is a very good measure of the entropy. And I, I have no qu quarrel with it at all. But I don't have a good overall measurement of entropy. So you might want to attribute an entropy to a star, say how much of the entropy in the star is due to its gravitational contribution. I imagine it's certainly relatively small compared with uh, anything like that, what you get for a black hole, and no question about that. But I don't have an answer. I certainly would not take the square of the um, vowel curve, it's, just, it's got the wrong dimensions and so on. You might take a few integrals of it, you see. You, you could do something like taking a, a potential for the vowel curvature, um, taking a double potential I mean, you, you, you can do something which looks like having the right dimensions, that sort of thing. I, there's a, there's a, you, could, you can make a guess at that. I haven't followed that up in any detail. Okay, there's a, I think I'll take one more question. Would conformal cyclic, cyclic cosmology imply a change in the cosmological constant over time? The way the equations are written, is almost that the cosmological constant is the one thing you definitely do not change. It, it doesn't mean that it doesn't change. In fact, it doesn't, people do often ask me this kind of question. And certainly John Wheeler, uh, I remember when he talked, not this kind of model because he didn't know about this kind of model, but the, the older Friedman bouncing models and things like that, well, he did speculate about constants of nature changing from eon to eon. Um, I was never too keen on that. I would much prefer the constants to be, to be constant <laughs> through <laughs> uh, the transition. And once you've got equations, you see, you have to have some equation governing the way the constants change, if they do change. You might have such a thing. I would simply only mention one thing which tells me that if they change, it's not an absolutely drastic change. And the reasoning here is that if you look at, well, analysis mainly done by Paul Todd and some other colleagues, where they looked at the sort of time where black holes start to run into each other. And that would be something like where we are in the eon. So when you draw the conformal diagram, so you've got Big Bang, uh, then crossover. So one crossover and then the next crossover. We are about three quarters of the way up this picture. And the black holes start to run into each other in a serious way at round about the same time. Now, if you think of that as the earliest time 
that supermassive black holes can run into each other, that gives you a limit to the size of the rings that you could get in Vahe's analysis. They, the limit to this is about 40 degrees across the sky. Now you can look at the rings, the biggest rings in Vahe's analysis, and you see them and they are around about 30 degrees or a bit more. So you see something which is pretty consistent with that. That is to say that they're not radically different. You don't see them you know, cutting off at 10 degrees or you don't see them at 70 degrees. You see them at a sort of scale which is consistent with the picture that the black holes in the previous eon started to run into each other when the galactic clusters started to bang into each other. You see, we're round about now, in a sense, we're going to run into the, into the Andromeda galaxy. And I don't know how long that will take, but it's not so far off from now, in a certain quotes. Uh, so I think it's indicating that the universe doesn't completely turn itself upside down into something very different with the numbers. But you see, if they don't evolve, you want equation for telling them how they, how they evolve, because the transition from one year to the next, in a certain sense, is very smooth. It's not a dramatic thing in, in a certain... I mean, Christoph Meisner had a very good worry about, you know, whether the Planck scale is going to come in and wreck everything. But according to the calculation he did, you get, get away with it without having to worry about the Planck scale. And you can follow your equations quite smoothly from one eon into the next and do serious particle physics on the other side without having to worry about things which we have no idea what goes on. So I think there's good scope for trying to match features in the future with features in the past. And this was a question that Jim Peebles raised with me. Can you actually look at the remote future and see what constants are involved in the the structure of the remote future, I mean, how much matter there, how, many, how much hydrogen there is and so on and so forth, and compare that with in the, in the uh, Big Bang, the, the unknown numbers there, do they tie up in some way? That would be very interesting to see. Okay, thank you. I think uh, uh, 10 questions will be sent to you, Roger, by okay. this evening. Oh, uh, they evening. will be <laughs> by tonight. <laughs> The organizers are requesting you to have a look. I'll and have a of look. Course, <laughs> and of course, answer at your leisure. <laughs> I, I think I have to put a cap on the number of questions. I hope yes, 10, 10, 10, 10. If you find an 11th question was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and then the 12th. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right. Thank you so much, Roger, for this uh, brilliant talk. Very Thank illustrative you. and beautiful. Uh, let's all thank Roger for this talk. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Okay. How do we do this? Oh, I see this is red, isn't it? So you, ha, huh, okay, that's fine. That's great, yeah. yeah. I think I did it there, that's right, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you. All right, well, bye. Goodbye, and nice, nice talking to you. <laughs> yeah. See you then. Thank you very much, yeah. No, no, I've enjoyed it, so that's good fun. I hope it didn't collapse, because sometimes I give talks and something terrible goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think everything went well. <laughs> it's good work this time. Very good. Wonderful. Yes. yes. OK. Thank good. you so much, Roger. Uh, and I can't find these little signals. <laughs> yeah, I have to, I have to, to, to dis disengage myself. Let me just okay. look, look it down. Then. It's fine. So, uh, shall we invite our next uh, speaker? Yeah, the next speaker is here. Hello, Abhay. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. So, right. okay, so uh, 
Let me uh, begin by introducing Professor Abayashtikar. Uh, Abayashtikar was born in Kolhapur, if I remember right, and did his undergraduate work in Mumbai, which is where I got to know him first. Uh, he was a brilliant student, and uh, I still remember that he had recommended that I study topology from Kelly's book. I don't know whether you remember that, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> After Mumbai, he obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1978, and uh, his PhD advisor was uh, Bob Keroch. So presently, he's the director of the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos. Ivan Pook, professor of physics and the holder of the Eberly Chair at Pennsylvania State University in the United States. Abai has made fundamental contributions to general relativity. I would like to especially mention his foundational work on the asymptotic structure of space-time and the description of gravitational waves in full nonlinear general relativity. Quantizing general relativity, as we all know, is an outstanding challenge in theoretical physics because the theory is hopelessly divergent in perturbation theory. Abai has made a heroic attempt to quantize general relativity by reformulating it like a gauge theory in terms of new variables which bear his name, Ashtika variables. These ideas led to a formulation of quantum gravity called loop quantum gravity, in which he continues to play a very active role and also in its applications to problems in cosmology. I should mention that uh, string theory is another framework to quantize gravity. And hopefully in the future, the good points of both approaches would come together to solve this fundamental problem. Abai is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and an honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in Bangalore. He was awarded the Einstein Prize of the American Physical Society for outstanding contributions to gravitational science. He has held many prestigious visiting positions, including the C.V. Raman Chair of the Indian Academy of Science, the Kramer's Visiting Chair in Theoretical Physics, at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. As far as his synergetic activities are concerned, he is a past president of the International Society for General Relativity and Gravitation and a past chair of the Division of Gravitational Physics of the American Physical Society. With those few words, I would like to welcome Abhay to deliver his talk. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Spanta. It is a great pleasure for me. Uh, we're starting about 10 minutes late, so I'll try to sure. go through all the things a little bit faster. Yes. Um, I, I also want to start with uh, paying homage to Professor Kumar Chitre. Um, I, like Spanta, I, I really first met him when I was an undergraduate, and he was very kind in that I had written some, you know, a small report on some ideas about cosmology. In fact, wondering if, in fact, the if the gravitational constant were time varying, then uh, what would happen uh, to the early cosmology? And it was not very sophisticated, but Professor Chitre really was very kind to write up uh, very encouraging uh, uh, notes and telling me how to proceed. And therefore, I thought it would be most appropriate if I went back to cosmology uh, in, the, in, in this uh, talk uh, in honoring his memory. So the talk is Einstein's cosmos and the, and the quantum. And um, yeah, and um, it is really a work by many, many people. But the one, the, the main results that I would like to sort of uh, uh, highlight in this talk are really were obtained uh, with these people up here. And this is a PRL that appeared last year and the detailed paper, uh, we just got proofs uh, 
um, and it is on the archives, uh, which in fact is addressed to both cosmologists and quantum gravity people, uh, is, is the reference up here is, is given here. Um, okay, so let me start with the preamble. Roger has already told us quite a bit about general relativity and cosmology. Um, and the, the main point was that really that modern cosmology was born soon after the discovery of general relativity. In fact, Einstein and De Sitter both wrote the first papers on cosmology in 1917. In this respect, it is sort of interesting to sort of look back and see the great leaps that Einstein took, just like Newton had taken a great, great leap when he said that, well, the apple which is falling from the tree figuratively and the planets which are going around sun, they really obey the same universal laws. Einstein took it a step further and the equations that he had actually obtained from considerations of conceptual coherence between special relativity and Newtonian gravity, he really applied them to the universe as a whole. And the tests that were available at that time, like bending of light and so on, really referred to solar system, but he really applied to the universe as a whole. And that is really the beginning of the modern cosmology. So in these models, universe is eternal in these two models that, that we had, and there is no beginning and not the end. And these two models dominated for over 15 years. Even though dynamical cosmological models were available, particularly by Friedman uh, and, and by, uh, by Lemaitre, um, and the Friedman-Lemaitre models really entered mainstream only after observational discovery that the universe is indeed dynamical. It is very curious history why, even though these models were really available here, it took more, it took about 10 years for them to be even enter the mainstream. But still, they were not widely accepted for another three or four decades. <clears throat> and that is because of aesthetic and philosophical preferences dominated discussions. In particular, there was a Soviet program led by Lifshitz, Landau Lifshitz, that everybody probably knows, and by Kalatnikov. Um, in the 50s and 60s, which sort of the main idea there was singularities of general relativity were probably artifacts of high symmetry and a generic solution of Einstein's equation, which is what we should be using to describe the universe, would not have these singularities. And then, for example, there was also the steady state universe, which dominated uh, <coughs> the field quite a bit up until the 70s because of prominent people like Hoyle, Hoyle Bondi, Gold, Shyama, and Narlikar were proposing it, where the universe is sort of on the whole, there, there is no Big Bang. In fact, the word Big Bang was introduced by Hoyle almost in a pejorative sense to make fun of the idea. But now it is the, the, the model that everybody feels, knows about, and undergraduates and the graduate students may not even know that there are alternatives. Well, as is often the case at the forefront of science, the paradigm shifted because of combination of observations and theory. There was a strong case for a dynamical universe with, a, uh, with, a very, uh, with an uh, early hot phase that came to forefront because of two developments. One was a nuclear abundances measurements and the nucleosynthesis. And that was started by George Gamow, but then also taken up by other people like Bette and Chandra and so on. And then the second thing was of course the cosmic microwave background which really was sort of its physical origin was understood by uh, Decay and his then students and, and, and collaborators, and then was discovered first by Penzias and Wilson. Um, and by the way, there's just a re recent monograph that just came about, which, which has all these papers. And I, in that I have given some uh, introductory, long introduction to see how the concepts of about uh, the universe have evolved in time that might be useful to students and postdocs. Oops, sorry. Okay. So now observation of the early universe. The past three decades have witnessed spectacular advances in our understanding of the early universe. For on the observational side, the cosmic microwave background was really understood. It was really, its, its properties were really observed in great detail, uh, first by the by Kobe, then by WMAP, and most recently by Planck. And the most recent data of Planck came in 2018. And on the theoretical side, the precision measurements 
I've, I've solidified and changed also the theoretical paradigm considerably. The first sort of astonishing fact is that starting from one part in 10 to the five CMB fluctuations, when the universe was only about 400,000 years young, we can arrive from known physics and astrophysics at the observed large scale structure of the universe. Now, that is to say about 3.8 billion years later. In human terms, this is the point that we start here for the cosmic microwave background, and then we use general relativity and known physics, astrophysics to arrive at this, at this large scale structure up here. And this really is a triumph. And in human terms, if you compare 380,000 to 3.8 billion years, you find that it is really one day to 100 years. So it's like taking a snapshot of a baby at when the baby is a day old and really predicting everything, what the, the person would look like when the person is 100 years old. So can you imagine how much, um, how much um, physics, astrophysics, uh, how, sorry, how much in, in, in the human terms, how much uh, uh, physiology and um, uh, biochemistry of the body that one, one would have to understand uh, for the baby. And it's really, we should all be very happy and proud that we can do that for a universe. But the second key thing that has happened is really a big departure from the way the universe was thought of in the early 80s. Namely, it was understanding. It, it now, I think, in most major approaches, there is the recognition that quantum field theory plays a key role. There's a major shift up here. Um, and basically because cosmological perturbations in the very early universe are now represented by quantum fields on cosmological space times in all systematic approaches. So this is very, very different from the, just using um, uh, you know, Bianchi models or inhomogeneous models that people did in the 80s, just looking at classical general relativity. So this is the kind of the first say, uh, the, the first part uh, of my talk, which says um, uh, the Einstein's cosmos and, and the quantum, quantum is already coming up here. And this is kind of very widely used. Second, and the third point is that the origin of tiny anisotropies, even in the CMB, can be traced back to the vacuum fluctuations of these quantum fields. And these vacuum fluctuations cannot be switched off, even in principle, because of Heisenberg uncertainty relations. And therefore, there's a brand new cosmogenesis that the origin of the large scale structure lies in quantum nothingness. And this really is kind of a spectacular advance, I think, that we are seeing that, first of all, we can trace back this to this, and then this really, we can trace back to the quantum fluctuations, the quantum nothingness in the universe. And as Raja already mentioned, uh, one of the leading um, uh, scenarios that people use is inflation. And, and that is because it has been quite successful. Um, and this is the most commonly used paradigm in the early universe. But of course, as Raja already mentioned, and many of us have said that, that the that the initial motivations for inflation in either in terms of monopoles or in terms of explaining the homogeneity of the universe and so on, they really are, they cannot be justified. But the thing is that we can focus more on observational successes and conceptual limitations. I mean, it is often the case in theoretical physics that one can start out by, uh, by some motivations which might be misplaced, but nonetheless, the final outcome would be very, very uh, important. And this, for example, is a very, very famous instance of this is Dirac's motivation for his equations. I mean, at that time, he did not know about the positron and he thought that the, uh, we had the electron and we had the proton and one was trying to come, uh, find a single equation which would talk about both at the same time. But Dirac equation, of course, is cornerstone of modern physics. So perhaps some ideas from, from inflation might be cornerstones in the future world. But there are limitations. And the limitations, for example, from the space-time per perspective is that the paradigm continues to use general relativity with its Big Bang singularity. It just begins, so to say, the middle, a uh, little bit after the Big Bang, when space-time curvature is, has left the Planck regime is about 10 to the um, 11 
uh, 10 to the minus 11 times the Planck curvature. And we need a quantum gravity theory now to go beyond. So this is the second way, the second way that the word quantum is, and will ent enters in my talk up here. And the viewpoint that most of us have is really the viewpoint that was advocated by Jim Peebles, that one does, should not in, uh, regard inflation as a fundamental theory, but rather as a framework on which to hang a fundamental theory, a guiding principle, a little bit like the Bohr border of atom, <coughs> which was not fundamental theory at all, but then led to the Schrodinger Heisenberg quantum mechanics. To arrive at a fundamental theory, we, we, I would like to note two things. One is that neither the CMB nor the success of inflation, inflation imply that there was a Big Bang. The Big Bang is a prediction of general relativity in a domain where it is not applicable because quantum effects would become very, very important. For example, we know that quantum effects are very important at nuclear densities and particularly the astrophysics of macroscopic objects like neutron star. But nuclear density is completely negligible, about 10 to the minus 80 times the Planck density. And therefore it is sort of, it would be very surprising if in fact one can just ignore uh, uh, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory and so on in this, in, this, in, the, in this regime near the Big Bang. In fact, Einstein himself has said that one may not assume the validity of field equations at very high density of the field or matter. And one may not conclude that the beginning of the expansion should be a singularity in the mathematical sense. And indeed now, by now the Big Bang, most cosmologists don't think by Big Bang, they don't mean really singularity, but they just mean an early hot phase of the universe and not an initial singularity. And I would like to sort of, uh, sort of draw attention to students and so on to this short video, uh, the new meaning of Big Bang in which Roger and Stephen Hawking and a few, a few other people feature it's a short one, about six six minutes. Uh, but we were all filmed completely separately. We did not know uh, completely different locations, different countries, different continents. We did not know what other people were saying. But in fact, we say very similar things about the nature of the Big Bang, namely that in fact it's not the absolute beginning. It's not a singularity, and so it's a good good. It might be an interesting thing for uh, students and so on to watch. So this is the first part of the preamble. And now I would like to make really start with the talk itself. And the talk has the, the, the three parts and a short summary. The first is the six parameter standard cosmological model. So let me just summarize what the six parameter standard cosmological model is for those who may not know about this. Well, motivated largely by inflation, what one assumes is that the primordial power spectrum of the cosmological density or tens tensor fluctuations. And these again are represented by quantum fields as I was telling you before. And so these fluctuations, the, primary, the, the primordial spectrum, the spectrum in the very beginning is, has a certain form which is given by a number, which is the amplitude and another number, which is, um, um, which is called the, the, the scalar spectral index. And then there is a ratio of wave numbers up here and K is the actual wave number. So this power is at a given wave number and K star is really a, a pivot uh, scale for the, for the um, uh, wave number. And the, the K star is the pivot co-moving wave number. And for the Planck mission, K star is about 0 0.05 megaparsec minus one. Now to evolve the primordial perturbation. So these were some fluctuations in the very early universe. And in the modern the terminology, this came about because of quantum fluctuations of fields, quantum fields representing the, uh, uh, the, the perturbations. And then the question is really, how does this primordial spectrum uh, evolve in time? Because we don't see this, what we see is something in CMB. So how do you arrive from this primordial spectrum to CMB? Well, we need four more parameters. There are matter densities, the, the baryonic and the cold dark matter that dictate the acoustic oscillations. And then there is the angular scale of the baryonic oscillations, which is typically, which is called 100 times theta, the angle of uh, mega clusters. And then there is a reionization optical depth, which is tau. And this tau uh, sort of measures the, uh, the, the, the length, so to say, if you like, the duration of the reionization epoch. 
Then given the six parameters, the two ones in the primordial spectrum and four others, we say how this initial primordial spectrum evolves in time, we can arrive at, theoretically we can arrive no, using known physics and astrophysics at four correlation functions. There's a temperature temperature correlation function, temperature electric polarization, electric polarization, electric polarization, and um, uh, 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 the, the uh, lensing amplitude, lensing amplitude, um, uh, 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 the lensing potential uh, correlation function. Now these four relation functions that we have here, they can be measured observationally. And so one can compare the theoretical predictions with these observations and provide probability distributions for the six pa uh, cosmological parameters that went into these predictions. And the mean values of the marginalized probability distributions provide us the six parameters together with the six, uh, together with the one sigma spreads, and that determine a given lambda CDA model. So this is the six parameter lambda CDA model. Now it has had huge successes. Everybody has seen these pictures many, many times. Uh, what one is doing here is really the first of these, which is the temperature temperature correlation function. And this is really, to begin with is angular correlation function in the angle in the sky, but that then is converted into spherical harmonics and we get CS. L refers to the spherical harmonic decomposition. And we get a plot which is like this. And you can see that the observations, the observational points really lie, um, uh, completely agree on the theoretical predictions. They lie exactly on the theoretical curve up here, except at very low wave numbers, or at large um, wavelengths. Here you can see that there is actually, a, observationally, there is less power than that is predicted by the, uh, by the theoretical model up here. Um, so the, the, overall, one has had huge success, but then there are these anomalies. And the first anomaly is, in fact, this power suppression anomaly that I talked about up here. And this anomaly becomes much more sort of pronounced, it has been known since the WMAP days. If we go back to the angular correlation function up here and plot the angular correlation function directly instead of doing the spherical harmonic decomposition. So the first anomaly is a large scale power spectrum, uh, the power anomaly, there is actually power deficit. And this refers to the large scale because it's a large angular scale in the sky, small wave numbers, large wavelength and large angular scale. And here there, there are these Two plots. The first is what is predicted by the standard ansatz that was made from the beginning and what is really observed. And you see that there is actually, the power is actually suppressed quite a bit related to the prediction. And it is sort of, it was introduced already in the, in the WMAP time that a good measure of this, of this is to compute a number, which is really just calculating the square of, of this power of, of this power angular power squared between 60 degrees and 180 degrees and what one finds is that in fact uh, when you calculate it the the the, uh, the ob observed power is much more is, is much less than the prediction i mean by a factor of almost four so there's a there's a big anomaly that is up here the statistical significance of this anomaly is only between two and three sigma but still, there is, there is this anomaly. The second is a lensing amplitude anomaly. So this really is, the lensing really refers to the gravitational lensing that CMB, the cosmic microwave background photons, experience as they approach us, starting from the CMB. And here I'm plotting it against optical depth. Optical depth is, in some sense, the least, the, all the parameters are very well measured, but this is the least well measured parameter. The, the, the uncertainty in the sense of standard deviation divided by mean value for optical depth is about 13%, whereas for all other parameters is less than 1%. So if I look at now the lensing amplitude, which is and the uh, optical depth, we obtain a certain plot. Th these are the two, one sigma and the two sigma contours up here. And you can see the standard model assumes that the lensing amplitude is one, and you can see that one actually lies outside. This is the value of the optical depth that is produced in the standard model, cosmological model, WMAP model, that, I'm sorry, uh, Planck model that I just mentioned. And now we can see that this, this point, 
lies outside one sigma level. And now if you want to sort of alleviate this anomaly, one can introduce spatial curvature, but if we do that, then in fact, you have got other problems. And therefore, um, uh, Joe Silk and his collaborators um, led, were led to make a uh, suggestion that there is a potential crisis in cosmology. Now, so should we be concerned with these anomalies? Well, the statistical significance of any one anomaly is low, but taken, taken together, they imply that we live in a very special realization. So for example, if you look at um, two anomalies that I mentioned just now at the same time, then it would say that we live in a very special realization, one realization in a million of the posterior probability distribution predicted by the theory. And the Planck team itself in its latest results says, if any anomalies have primordial origin, then their large scale nature would suggest an explanation rooted in fundamental physics. Thus it is worth exploring any model that might explain an anomaly, even better multiple anomalies naturally or with few parameters. So therefore the anomalies are interesting, they are gates to sort of go beyond the standard cosmological model. Now the question is, well, what could, change, right? How, how could we change the predictions of the standard cosmological model? And what could change is really the input. The input was that the primordial power spectrum is just given by these two numbers, AS and NS. So it's really nearly scale invariant. If NS were equal to one, then this factor would drop out and it will be just scale invariant. It will be just a constant. And here we get a small red tilt that one observes in the cosmological, in, in the, the CMB uh, power spectrum. And now surprising it, as it may seem at first, these standard answers can be modified by quantum gravity considerations. In loop quantum cosmology, the, primary, the primordial spectrum is, is in fact nearly scale invariance as in the standard theory, but only for large scale. For small scale, that is to say at the large angular scales where I got these anomalies, there is power suppression already at the primordial level. And then it goes on to alleviate the two anomalies I mentioned. The possibility raised by Planck in its uh, both 2015 and 2018 papers is realized in loop quantum cosmology. And so therefore there is a manifestation of quantum gravity in the sky. So this completes my first part, which is what is a standard cosmological model. And now I would like to be uh, begin the second part, which is loop quantum cosmology. I already mentioned up here that basically what, what happens is that the primordial power spectrum is changed the question is, how does this happen? So to understand that, I have to introduce some very basic elements of loop quantum cosmology. So basic, the idea is that we don't start in the middle as one does in the inflation, but we really can start right in the Planck epoch and evolve per cosmological perturbations starting from there. So loop quantum cosmology is a cosmological sector of quantum gravity. As we'll see, there is an ex excellent agreement with standard inflation at small angular scale, but departure at large angular scales where the CAB anomalies lie. So I have to make a detour to tell you about the basic ideas about loop quantum cosmology. So recall that general relativity is founded on Einstein's outrageous idea. And the outrageous idea is that gravity is not a force, but a manifestation of curved space time. Therefore, general relativity needed a new syntax to describe classical physics in presence of gravity, in presence of general relativistic gravity. And the new physics, the new syntax was Riemannian geometry that we all use. In loop quantum gravity viewpoint is that, that Einstein has taught us that geometry is very much like matter. It's a physical entity. It's not just an inner stage out there. And therefore, it can be acted upon in act back. Now, matter has atomic structure and therefore geometry also should have atomic structure. And therefore we need a new, quantum gravity needs a new syntax to formulate all of known quantum physics. And that syntax is a quantum Riemannian geometry. So we have to elevate Riemannian geometry to introduce into it non commutative features which come in a certain way. And this was systematically developed by a large number of researchers over the last three decades, since about mid, mid, uh, mid 80s, so since about beginning of 90s. Now, 
So quantum geometry <clears throat> is, um, so what we have is really at a fundamental level, a quantum Riemannian geometry. Now, it's a Riemannian geometry gives us a metric and therefore we can measure geometrical quantities like areas. For example, area of the screen that you are now looking at on, on, your, on your mobile device or on your laptop or volume of the region, volume of the room that you are sitting in. Now, these are observables in general relativity. The reason is because they depend on the metric in space time in the region where your laptop is or where the room is. Now, therefore, in quantum, in quantum, in quantum gravity, they would become self adjoint operators. And these, op so there are self adjoint operators which would correspond to areas of physical surfaces and volumes of physical regions. And in Riemannian quantum geometry of loop quantum gravity, they are quantized in a precise sense that their eigenvalues are discrete. It's just like what happens for the hydrogen atom. We have got fundamental observables, the energy, the total angular momentum, and the Z component of the angular momentum. Classically, they take on continuous volume values, but in quantum, mechanical, quantum theory, they take on discrete values. The same thing happens to geometry, Riemannian geometry in loop quantum gravity. Continuums arises as a coarse grain approximation like this in, the, in, in this impression painting. If you look at any one dot in this little painting up here, I mean, you don't see really continuum. There's a dot, 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 dot. And yet, when they're put together, you have a nice continuum um, uh, illusion. So the discrete eigenvalues of loop quantum geometry, they actually crowd exponentially as the, as the areas grow. And therefore, for macroscopic object, the continuum approximation is reached very quickly. And general relativity becomes an excellent approximation very quickly. But the fundamental discreteness of quantum geometry, in particular, the smallest area, there's a smallest non-zero area. Uh, just like in superconductivity theory, you have got an uh, area gap here. Uh, sorry, in superconductivity, we have got energy gap, which is the fundamental microscopic uh, parameter that governs all the macroscopic phenomena, such as the, the temperature at which superconductivity actually occurs, the critical temperature. Similarly, in loop quantum gravity, the area gap, the smallest allowed area, is really a fundamental microscopic parameters that then governs macroscopic parameters, such as what, what is the upper bound on the curvature space-time can have, what is the upper bound on density that space-time, that matter can have, and so on. And in loop, in cosmological models, all strong curvature singularities are naturally resolved. Physical quantities, such as energy, energy density, curvature, and anisotropies that diverge at the Big Bang remain finite and furthermore have an absolute bound in all physical states. There is an introductory video on loop quantum gravity. It's long, 75 minutes long, but it will give you the basic ideas. And there is also a short recent review that just appeared just this last month, I think, um, which is uh, which was commissioned by the by IOP, by the uh, reports on progress in physics, and that that might be useful because it was really written to non expert for for non expert. So singularity is resolved. So what is behind the singularity resolution? So there is no unphysical matter or no new boundary conditions like, for example, the Hartle-Hawking boundary condition. There is no new such input there, but rather the new thing, the new element is that quantum is the quantum geometry. And it is the quantum nature of geometry that creates a brand new repulsive force in the Planck regime. And this brand new repulsive force, which classical theory does not know anything about, overwhelms the classical attraction, and then Big Bang is replaced by Big Bounce. So if you go back in time, the universe is contracting, the matter density curvature is increasing. Once it reaches the Planck regime, there is a bounce. And this is analyzed in detail using the Hamiltonian methods, path integral methods, and consistent histories framework by a large number of people. In the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker models, the quantum Einstein equations dictate the relational evolution of the wave function of the universe, psi zero, which depends on the scale factor and the matter field. Observables such as matter density and curvature remains bounded on all solutions of quantum Einstein's equations in loop quantum cosmology. And furthermore, there's a universal upper bound on curvatures. 
And these universal upper bounds are completely determined by this area gap. As I was saying you, as I was telling before, area gap is a microscopic parameter and that determines the macroscopic parameter such as this upper bound. So for example, the maximum density matter can have goes like a fundamental constant divided by area gap Q. If area gap goes to zero, as in classical theory, then of course the, the maximum density can become infinite, but in loop quantum gravity, it does not become infinite. This is like what happened in the hydrogen atom where with the analogy that is often em emphasized by John Wheeler, where H bar in classical theory, the, uh, the energy yeah, is, is unbounded below, it can be minus infinity. If you put the, you can put the electron on the top of the proton and then the, tot the total energy will be minus infinity. But H bar comes to this, this rescue and it lifts it to minus 13.6 uh, electron volts. So there are many generalizations. Uh, first work was done in Friedman models, but there are very generalized, many generalizations, literally several thousands, tens of thousands of papers in loop quantum cosmology. And there is, that includes spatial curvature. There is a cosmological constant, anisotropies, inflaton potentials, um, simplest inhomogeneities in terms of Gaudi models and so on. And the qualitative summary is that every time a curvature scalar enters the Planck regime, the quantum geometry creates a repulsive force preventing it from a blow up. And the Big Bang is replaced by big bounds in the quantum space time is therefore vastly larger than the classical space time. So here's a picture of what happens, for example, in the Starobinsky potential. This is the inflationary potential that is used because it is most successfully, that is used often because it is most successful up here. The potential is given by, by a formula that is given up here. It has a parameter M um, and th th that's the only parameter it has. And so what happens is that in a, that the universe normally expands exponentially during inflation. So inflaton, this is the inflaton, the inflaton rolls down the potential. And as it rolls down the potential, the universe expands exponentially in this, in this direction up here. Um, but the point is that if you go back in uh, time, then the universal uh, inflaton will be climbing up the potential. And actually then it equations imply that it goes around a turn, it goes undergoes an, a turnaround. And in fact, the universe bounces. So universe does not go to zero volume, but the universe actually bounces up here. And the big bang is replaced by big bounce up here. And the Starobinsky potential is phenomenologically flavored. Uh, the same thing happens for the quadratic potential and M squared phi squared potential that is often used because of its simplicity. So the, finally, why does the Planck scale matter in all these considerations? Well, contrary to widespread belief, the pre inflationary dynamics does matter because the modes with large wavelength, the wavelength larger than the curvature radius are actually affected by the pre-inflationary dynamics, what happens in the Planck regime. It is very much similar, it's very similar to, for example, what happens when I'm taking a walk. When I'm taking a walk, my footsteps are, are much smaller than the radius of curvature of Earth, so I don't feel the radius of curvature of Earth. On the other hand, if I got to take a plane to go from Bombay, Mumbai to, to say London, then you do have to take into account curvature of Earth. So for large wavelengths, you have to worry about curvature of Earth. And you see this explicitly in the equations that are obeyed by cosmological perturbation that the, the radius of curvature occur, comes up explicitly. So in standard general relativity, I'm plotting here some typical times and typical length scales up here. And the radius of curvature becomes this way because at the Big Bang, the curvature blows up and radius of curvature goes to zero. And the wave, the physical wavelengths of various modes in the CMB perturbations, they actually, in the, in the early universe near the Big Bang, they would actually be evolving. Their physical wavelength would be growing because of the expansion of the universe. It grows linear with the scale factor. But all of them are always in, inside the radius of curvature up here. Whereas in loop quantum cosmology, because the curvature at the bounds is finite, the radius of curvature at the bounds is finite. Therefore, we could have some observable modes which actually are outside the radius of curvature. And therefore, these modes would feel the curvature in this Planck regime, and then they would get excited. And therefore, at the onset of inflation, they would not be in the Bunch-Davis vacuum, the standard vacuum state that people use. Whereas here, 
they, they are they are in the standard inflation they are in the vacuum state so there can be departures and the departures are only for the longest wavelength modes so there is a very interesting phenomena occurring here namely what tapes a singularity is the ultraviolet regularization of loop quantum cosmology natural regularization that comes up within the ultraviolet regime the new friedman model dynamics in turn affects the infrared behavior of perturbations because of this effect that i told you about and therefore there is an unforeseen in, in interplay between the ultraviolet and the infrared it is a modes which wavelength is larger than the curvature of radius at the at the bounds they feel the effect and they are affected so this is the main part of the talk now i mean the the the, the detailed part of the talk now i'll just tell you about the results so first of all let me tell you about the primordial spectrum up here remember the primordial spectrum in a standard uh, inflation or in standard models up here is really that is is really nearly scale invariant um so what i'm plotting up here is the ratio of the lqc to the standard standard answer the standard primordial spectrum so the ratio the, would be 1 if in fact the two spectra agree and it is equal to 1 for large wave numbers large wave numbers correspond to um, uh, uh, th these are the, 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 the yeah so here there is agreement and large wavelengths corresponds to small wavelengths or small angular scale so there there is complete agreement up here but at smaller wave numbers at larger angular scales there is actually suppression of power spectrum and so what happens to the of the observed power spectrum so this was the primordial one that is predicted by theory and now in 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 standard inflation it is it is postulated and here uh, sort of in standard inflation one begins at the at, in the middle so to say with a bunch davis vacuum and then one one, one ob obtains this near scale invariant power, power spectrum now when well, in loop quantum cosmology it is actually calculated starting with the starting with the planck scale dynamics dynamics of perturbations at the planck scale and then what what is observed power spectrum in lq in in the in the sky well the observed power spectrum in lqc um, which is in in blue you can see that there is actually power suppression up here relative to the standard one and it is much easier to see the power suppression in this i the c theta plot that i told you about this is the plot where one is not looking at the spherical harmonic decomposition but where one is looking at uh, angles between 60 degrees and 180 degrees where there is significant power suppression so here the black curve up here is the observe observe power spectrum the red curve up here is what the standard model predicts and you can see that the lqc power spectrum in view blue is really closer to the black curve the the uh, the tension that we talked about before is actually elevated and it is significantly elevated the quantity measure is really is is about this s1 half that i told you about is about 42000 and it is it becomes about a third of that only 14000 in lqc um yeah, bhai, how much time will you take now uh, i'll take about uh, i started at 10 minutes late yes so, so 40 for, yeah i'll take 5 minutes Okay, fine. Thanks. So anomaly in the uh, the the last anomaly is really in the in the uh, amplitude, the uh, the Lenzig amplitude in the tau plane, and again, what had happened was that the, that the, the 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 standard assumption that that a equal to one was was in in the standard uh, ansatz. It was really this was the standard ansatz. this point is outside one uh, outside the uh, one sigma whereas in lqc the lqc the standard ones are in pink the, L, the lqc one is in in blue the the whole plot is shifted downwards and therefore one has a good agreement with observations up here so here are the the, the various the six parameters of the of the model that were talked about these are standard ansatz this lqc so according to lqc we live in a so, somewhat different Uh, uh, lambda cdm universe than what is given by the standard ansatz that is in the planck papers out of the six parameters for this for the four parameters we have exactly the same uh, the, the the difference is less than 0.4% but 
for the optical depth, the difference is 9.8%. And remember, this is the parameter that is least well measured in CMB. And therefore, and, and, thus, and, and similarly, as I already mentioned, S1 half is 297, 297% um, higher than uh, in the standard answer than in the LQC, val L LQC value. So therefore, this anomaly is also alleviated. Okay, so now let me summarize. I began in my talk and also Roger mentioned that various ideas about the current ideas in cosmology up here. Um, the, but in my talk, I began with a little bit of history and what we saw there was that in the early part of the evolution of cosmology, our understanding of cosmology, there are various models and ideas were driven by philosophical prejudices, by aesthetics and so on. But what happened then is really that people took these aesthetics way too seriously. And for example, people thought that steady state universe or lambda, the cosmological constant must be actually zero. This, there should be a steady state universe and so on and so forth for many decades. But finally observations came and changed the picture and settled the picture and, and led us in the direction that we follow today. A similar thing is happening here. There are several ideas about going beyond the standard model of cosmology. And the nice thing is that observations are coming and theory is actually making uh, contact with these observations. So let us recall therefore this quote from Planck, which came from observations, that there are, the cosmic microwave background does explain the gross features, but we have also anomalies and th th these are of primordial origin. And uh, their large scale structure would suggest an explanation rooted, rooted in uh, fundamental physics. And it is worth exploring any models that might explain an anomaly or even better, multiple anomalies naturally or with few parameters. And that is what loop quantum cosmology has done. And there are going to be new measurements, for example, of optical depth, of um, uh, polarizations, the, the B more polarization, etc. And loop quantum cosmology has predictions for them. So there's really a way of confronting theoretical predictions with observations. So loop quantum cosmology provides a concrete um, uh, illustration of the desired primordial mechanism to significantly alleviate the two anomalies. This specific scheme also makes other predictions that could be tested in the upcoming observation missions, in particular the optimal uh, the optical depth and a different spectrum for the, uh, for the, for the B mode polarization of, the, uh, of, of CMB. And work is on progress on other anomalies, particularly the hemispherical an an anomaly. And some of these are already in the literature. So to me personally, what is sort of satisfying in all this is not that, you know, look on cosmology is succeeding, et cetera, but really that for a very long time, detailed quantum gravity theories had this mathematical perch and concept, they're struggling with conceptual and mathematical problems and they left that perch. In other words, they're mature sufficiently to come down and to make contact with phenomenology. And therefore it is like in other areas of physics, like in particle physics, where one has predictions that can be tested. So that is the most, um, uh, the, the, the most interesting uh, uh, point about the current status that I have up here. Uh, as to inflation, as Roger mentioned, the motivation is really not, um, um, was not compelling, but on the other hand, it has had many successes. And one of the things that is happening in loop quantum cosmology is really arriving at uh, this inflation, not by postulating, but arriving at it from quantum gravity perspective, namely corrections to Einstein's equation in full quantum gravity, full, full loop quantum gravity would naturally give rise to terms like in Starobinsky inflation, that might then explain the, uh, the, the observations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Abhay, for a very, very nice talk. Uh, there are many questions and uh, as like uh, with the talk of Roger, the organizers will be sending you some questions by the end of the day for you to uh, answer. And uh, however, a couple of questions that are here, maybe let me ask you. Uh, so one of the questions is, uh, why does uh, quantum gravity become repulsive at Planck scales? 
how does one understand this physically? Right. So, in the in, in look quantum gravity, the fundamental excitations of geometry are really polymer like, they are one dimensional. And for example, statements like one that there is a that the, the area spectrum is not continuous, but there is actually a lower bound. So there's zero, but then after that, there's a gap. There's a low, lowest non-zero minimum area. What that gives rise, what that says is basically that we've got these fundamental excitations. It's a bit like in type two superconductor where the magnetic field, rip, and, um, where the magnetic field lines are actually repulsed. Uh, so it's, it's a similar thing. Let me not digress because I, I could give, give a more detailed answer, but let me not digress. Uh, it's a bit like that. So what happens is that these flux lines of area, they, the reason why, for example, the screen behind in front of you is as an area about 100 square centimeter is because there are these flux lines of excitations of geometry, which are at Planck scale, each of which deposits only a Planck, you know, quantum of Planck area, but there are about 10 to the 76 of them, or 10 to the 78 of them, really going through your screen. And that is why you have got all this uh, area of 10 uh, so centimeters. But if you sort of shrink your screen more and more, you cannot shrink it in indefinitely in loop quantum gravity because there is actually the smallest um, area. So there's only one flux line that can really lie. What this means is really that there are also this, you cannot pack arbitrary amount of density, matter density into this, in, into this region. Right? There is actually, you, there's actually an upper bound to that. So it's really because the geometry is quantized through these flux lines and there's a flux quantum and there is no, no such thing as less than one flux quantum, if you like. And that is why geometry is quantized. And that is why uh, the curvature is in the upper bound for the curvature and upper bound for the densities. So why, why would there be, uh, what about the primordial gravitons actually? They are capitalists, yes. right? So right. is there some understanding of that? Yes, there's a complete understanding of that. I just did not have time that. In the papers, we have both the, uh, uh, the uh, scalar perturbations and the tensor, tensor modes, which are primordial gravitons. So the statement is that the, in fact, the, the mathematical analysis of tensor modes is simpler in many ways for, for technical reasons. And so this has, this has been worked out. And again, the, the, the statement is precisely that we have, um, we have this power suppression. Um, there is no, uh, 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 there is power suppression, primordial power suppression. So I should go up here. Yeah, there's a exactly the same primordial power spectral uh, suppression for tensor modes as, as well. Um, and there are predictions for this B mode polarization. In other words, there will be these gravitational waves coming in, they will affect C and B, and therefore that, that the effect on the C and B would be in the B mode polarization or parity po 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 uh, po uh, polarization. And one would actually see that in C and B. And there are more and more experiments, which are several missions are planning to see that and loop quantum cosmology has a prediction there. And again, there, the power is suppressed at the largest angular scales. So tensor, tensor modes or gravitons are also under full control. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Abhay. I think the rest of the questions you will get by mail. We are running out of time. And uh, thank you again for a very right. nice talk. So as I close my, my screen, let me just say that I really appreciate the hosts for doing this. We all have great admiration for, uh, for, for, for Kumar Chitre. And in these extremely difficult times in India with COVID, they were still able to organize this great meeting. So I would like to thank them very much. Thank you. Okay, is uh, Ramesh, there with us. Hi, Ralik. Yep. Hello. I'm here. Hi, hi. How are you? <laughs> it's a wonderful background you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Ramesh Narayan. And uh, let me, before he begins his talk, briefly introduce him. It's my great pleasure to do that. Uh, Ramesh Narayan was born in Mumbai and he 
grew up in Chennai or Madras, as it used to be called, graduated with a BSc in physics from Madras University and received a doctorate from Bangalore University. He worked at the Raman Research Institute and then Caltech and then University of Arizona before joining Harvard University in 1991, where he is the Thomas Dudley Cabot Professor of the Natural Sciences in the Department of Astronomy. He's an astrophysicist who is recognized for his wide ranging research in the area of high energy astrophysics. He is known particularly for his work on black holes where he has developed theoretical models of accretion and has used astronomical observations to elucidate the physical nature of both the accretion flow and the black hole. He has made significant contributions to the study of accretion disks active galactic nuclei, black holes, galaxy clusters, gamma ray bursts, all the stuff you can see. Gravitational lensing, gravitational waves, image restoration, neutron stars, pulsars, and scintillation. In the area of black holes, Ramesh has identified a new mode of accretion called radiatively inefficient accretion, and has shown that the vast majority of black holes in the universe accrete via this particular mode. Using accretion disks as a probe, he and his colleagues have developed methods to measure the spin of black holes. His theoretical work has a major bearing on the Event Horizon Telescope project, which made the first direct imaging of a black hole in 2019. His work is internationally recognized. He's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, and an honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He was part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration that was awarded the 2020 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Let me close by saying that he has close academic ties to India and he has visited the ICTS of TIFR in Bangalore a couple of times already. And so we hope to see you again when this uh, difficulties of the pandemic are behind us. Ramesh, your talk. Thank you, Spenta. A very kind introduction. So how much time do I have? Because I see that the your, clock your is- Your talk quite... is uh, 40 minutes. You take your full 40 minutes. It's, really? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I, okay, I, I, because I have no a feeling problem. some of your people are going to be getting sleepy. <laughs> no, I, no, it's, it's not that late. <laughs> it just uh... okay. <laughs> I'll try to go somewhat quicker to the extent okay. possible. Okay. So I'm going to talk about gravitational lensing, and I'll start with a slide. No, I have to see. Okay, I can change slides. Good. So. I'll start with something that uh, Roger Penrose showed already at the start of his talk, which is the deflection of light rays by gravitating masses. You do see my slides, right? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is a famous prediction that Einstein made in 1916. He calculated exactly how much deflection a light ray will experience when it goes past some gravitating mass. And for the specific case of a ray that goes close to the sun, the number was 1.7 arc seconds, which is kind of measurable. And this was confirmed in 1919 in the famous eclipse expedition. It was published in this paper in 1920. So there was this deflection which caused background stars to apparently move in the sky by just about the amount predicted by theory. And this was such an amazing confirmation of general relativity. This among all of Einstein's work is the one that really made it to the front page of newspapers. As far as I know, E equals MC squared was not front page news. E equals H nu was not. Those were all kind of too strange even for the physicists. But here was something, uh, a, a, a great prediction. And then it was confirmed by experiment. Apparently it was in the front page of the New York Times and perhaps in many English newspapers as well. Okay, so that's uh, long ago, you know, it's more than a hundred years ago. 
for many decades, people said, you know, we could have more extreme examples of gravitational deflection. We could have multiple images. So let's say we are here, observer, some distant source, cosmologically distant, let us say. If there is some compact mass intervening between us and the source, why can't we have one ray of light going off on one side of this object and reaching us so that we see an apparent image of this object in this direction. And maybe at the same time, we could have a ray that goes in the other direction on this side of the mass, get bent and we might see a second image. So looking for double images of background sources where the double images are created by some mass and people are thinking of galaxies, could be clusters of galaxies, etc., was a kind of holy grail. And it was finally realized in 1979 with the discovery of the so-called double quasar, Q0957 plus 561. Here is a kind of a, a sky picture of what this guy looks like. These are two images of a single quasar. Actually, Professor Narsimha showed a lot of this yesterday. So it's going to be a repeat of things he said. And there is a galaxy kind of in between these two images. This galaxy presumably is what is producing the two images in this case, assisted by a surrounding cluster. This is an example of what people like to call strong gravitational lens. Anytime you get two images or multiple images of a background object. Okay, now I didn't know anything about gravitational lensing until I heard a lecture by Chitre. He had visited Bangalore, but he used to visit often because he would lecture, he would teach at our so-called joint astronomy program and so he came, he gave a, a beautiful uh, colloquium in the Indian Institute of Science. I think it was the physics department. I'm not sure. It was the early eighties. I was at the Raman Research Institute at the time. And, you know, we used to go anytime a you know, famous person would come and give a talk anywhere in Bangalore, we would get into the Institute van and just go and listen to the talk. So we went to Chitre's talk. Beautiful summary. I'd never heard of lensing. He just laid it out in all the basic equations, the basic phenomenon, showed us that you know there is this double quasar that has been discovered, pretty much, you know, this picture. And then he made this uh, funny statement, kind of in the middle of the talk, a throwaway statement. Oh, you know, there should always be an odd number of images. And he was showing us this picture of the two images, right? He said, yeah, there should always be an odd number of images. The third guy is probably somewhere, you know, the middle of that galaxy. We are not seeing it. He didn't explain. You know, I think I know now, as you know, having been a professor for many years, you shouldn't explain everything to your students. You tell them a lot, explain a lot of stuff, but you leave a few things for them to figure out for themselves. And he did this beautifully. This thing stuck in my mind. You know, why should it be an odd number? Because this picture obviously shows you can get one this way, one this way. Why the hell should there be another extra third image? So you got a double quasar, but the claim is it should have an odd number. So on the van going back, I remember, this is something I remember now, you know, it's 40 years ago. I remember we had this animated discussion. Raja Ram Nityananda was there and several others. And, you know, we were waving our hands and we kind of pretty much figured out at an elementary level how this all works out. So for this, we need this lens equation, which actually Narsimha introduced yesterday. So once again, it's the same picture. There is a source far away. There is some lensing mass, this L, a galaxy, let us say. You are here, the observer. So we've got the two rays. One guy goes on this side and gets deflected by some angle alpha. Another ray goes this side, gets deflected again by some angle alpha, some other alpha. And from this figure here, you can see, with respect to the position of the lens, if this is the position of your image, orientation of your image at some angle theta, and let us say the source is at some other angle, beta with respect to this uh, reference direction, theta should be equal, beta should be equal to theta minus alpha. I mean, it's just, you know, beta plus alpha equals theta. So this is what is called the lens equation. Beta is theta minus alpha. And this alpha is, you know, apart from a proportionality constant, just the amount of deflection that your lens produces. And so here is a picture of what this deflection might look like. 
very far away from the lens. There's hardly any deflection. So this, you know, deflection is essentially zero asymptotically. As you come closer and closer, the deflection increases. And there's a nice formula that Einstein derived in the linearized gravity limit. You can use that. On the other side of the galaxy, of course, the deflection is in the opposite direction, so it's negative. So somewhere in the middle, you have got to join up these two guys. In fact, the way it works is this deflection depends only on the interior mass. So as you come closer and closer to the lens, the amount of deflection you experience, the ray experiences actually decreases because there's less and less interior mass and right through the lens, in fact, it is zero in symmetric cases. So the deflection should look something like this. Your lens equation says beta equals theta minus deflection. So here is a plot that has beta in the vertical axis, theta in the horizontal axis. This black line is theta minus alpha. So this is without deflection, this is just beta equals theta, the diagonal. You subtract out the deflection, it's going to look like this. So whatever position you choose for the image, it tells you where the source has to be. And if let us say the source happens to be at this position beta, you can see that there's only one point that corresponds to that beta and you only have one image. This is a location somewhat far from the center of the lens. As you come closer to the lens, you can start intersecting this line multiple times. And so here is, for instance, a case where you can have three images. One on this side, one more on that side, and one on the other side, and so on. You can put the source at various locations. You always get three images in this picture. And then if you go too far to the left of the lens, you go back to one image. And the point here is very simple. Asymptotically, you can only have one image. Images are intersections of a horizontal line with this lens equation line. Anytime you get additional images, it always has to come in pairs. It's just, you know, kind of, you can call it a topology argument. You're starting off positive, you're ending up negative. However many wiggles you put here, you'll always get an odd number of images. So the extra image has to be there. It's usually always right near the center of the galaxy. In fact, it's exactly what Chitra said. The guy is probably down here in the middle somewhere. We don't see it. Okay, so this was clear, so we could understand this. And I think we had this before we reached RRI. That was pretty good. You know, we were young. It could take me longer now. Uh, it was not at all obvious how this would generalize to multiple dimensions, right? The sky is a two-dimensional plane. This is actually a vector equation. Theta is a vector position. Theta is a vector position for the image. Alpha is a vector deflection. That, you know, we just kind of told ourselves I think it should work, but I myself didn't have a complete picture until a few years later when uh, Nityananda actually showed we should think of this vector equation as the gradient of a scalar. And then you can look at the topology of the scalar, which is a nice, you know, scalar function of two sky coordinates. You look at extrema in that surface, and again, it becomes immediately transparently obvious that you should have an odd number of images. I won't go into the details. That was based on Fermat's principle. Okay. Soon after the double quasar, a triple quasar was discovered. Wyman et al. Just one year later, PG 1115, three images. One bright guy, two fainter guys. In fact, now they are in a triangle. They are not no longer in a straight line with the galaxy. They are now in a triangle. And you know, the first thing, you know, your impression is great. We had a theorem for odd images we have found a nice fellow with odd images. But then people started making models, model Young et al. and then the TIFR group, Narasimha, Subramanian, and Chitre. And what they said was, you know, it might look like three images. Actually, what you have is four images. And actually there are five images. One is invisible, it's too dim. We are seeing four images of which two happen to be merged together. And then there are two others that are resolved. I remember feeling really cheated. You know, here is a third, triple quasar, three images, theorem says three or five or whatever. And uh, I'm being told that it's not three, but it's actually five and we are seeing four, et cetera. So I did spend some time trying to prove them wrong. No way, you never quarrel with the TIFR group. Like Narsima said, the TIFR group made all the 
models of gravitational lenses for a decade, basically in the 80s. And so here is kind of their model. Now it's of course completely confirmed. There is a close pair of images. What was originally A is two of them. B and C are on the other side. You can now see the galaxy. And presumably there is the fifth image in the middle. It has not been actually seen as far as I know, but that is the galaxy. In fact, there's even the Einstein ring, which now people study. I won't go into any of those details. Okay, so why is this image missing? Seems to be missing in pretty much all the cases. It's a quite a question of uh, amp magnification. I'll just say this very shortly. What matters is the slope of this line at the point where you know intersect. So they have got these three red dots here. The slope of this line or the inverse of the slope of this line tells you how bright the image is. And if you've got a compact lensing mass where this line at the center, which produces the extra image, if that is very steep, then it's highly dim. And that's the reason why this extra image is always hard to find, in fact, it's hardly ever been seen. In fact, you can go to the extreme as explained in this 86 paper by the TIFR group. If the very center of the galaxy is dominated by a supermassive black hole, then, that line essentially becomes you know, infinitely steep or saying it different words, the black hole effectively eats up that odd image. So the image you can say is there, except it's been eaten up by the black hole and you only see the two images on the side or four as the case may be, or six, eight, et cetera. The odd image is always missing. Okay, so this is all good old history. Uh, I stopped working on lensing. I mean, actually, I started doing some work on lensing and all due to Chitre's talk. And I studied the literature and after I went to Caltech, I did some papers for about five, 10 years. Then I stopped working. So I missed this next paper, which I want to just briefly explain here. This is Veerabhadra et al. Veerabhadra and Chitre in 1998. And they looked at uh, you know one of these uh, toy metrics in GR, it's a, it's a model where there is both mass and a scalar charge. And this particular model, which actually it's a singular model, as I remember, this particular model has the feature that if a, so this is my lens, if a ray of light goes far away from the lens, it's only mildly deflected. Then I come closer and closer, I get more and more deflection, right? This is exactly like a normal, gravitational lens, but because of the scalar charge for certain choices of parameters, if you come close enough to the lens, actually it's, the ray is repelled. It goes off in the other direction. Instead of getting bent towards the lens, it gets kicked out in the other direction. This is a new kind of a behavior. So you can have rays that are bent both in and out. And in terms of ray deflection, this is what it looks like. So far away, essentially zero, deflection keeps increasing. Then I come close enough to the center of the lens. The center of the lens is at this uh, location. It reverses direction and the deflection goes to zero and then goes off negative and goes you know, large negative. You can think of it essentially as diverging. And of course, it's still anti-symmetric. On the other side, it's the same pattern, except in the opposite direction. So this is what alpha looks like. In particular, alpha is no longer a continuous function, right? The previous picture I showed had an alpha that went like this. This is a regular gravitational lens, galaxy or whatever. This guy, this toy model has got a break in the middle. It's kind of singular in some sense. So you can go back and do the lens equation, beta equals theta minus alpha. This is what the curve looks like. So wherever you choose your source, you know, you just draw your horizontal line and ask, where are my images? This model will always produce an even number of images, not odd. So that was actually there in their uh, paper, even number of images, two Einstein rings, you know, all sorts of crazy things happen. And it's all completely obvious. You're breaking the old odd number of image theorem because your lensing deflection is no longer a continuous smooth function. It's got these breaks, infinities, et cetera. 
and this guy will give two images for a source very far away from the lens. Both images are on the same side. One is the regular image that you can expect. The second guy is produced because of the repulsion of the rays and so on. If you come close enough to the lens, you can get four images, four, and then you go back to two, et cetera, et cetera. Very cute. I mean, I don't know whether we expect this in the real universe, but for me, it was, you know, it was just interesting because I had spent time thinking about odd images and suddenly I hear that you can have ev even images. Sure, with a picture like this, it's obvious. Okay, that's all kind of old history. So in the history of gravitational lensing in astrophysics, people generally make a distinction between weak lensing and strong lensing. Weak lensing would be, for instance, deflection by the sun. You only have one image, but like Roger showed in his talk, that image is shifted with respect to the position of the source. It's also distorted. A circular source will look like an ellipse. So, you know, it'll have distortions, shape changes, its brightness may go up or down a little bit. You know, everything is, however, somewhat weak in effect and only one image. We use the term strong lensing when you have multiple images and the multiple images may be produced by a single star. That's micro lensing. It may be produced by a galaxy like the quasar images I showed. It can even be produced by a whole cluster of galaxies. Those are the giant arcs that Narsimha showed yesterday. But even though we call it strong lensing, you still have to keep in mind that the actual deflections are very small. The angles are all very small. We're talking about, you know, milli arc seconds or arc seconds or maybe arc minute in the case of clusters, but that's still a tiny angle. I'm going to talk now about a new kind of lensing, ultra strong lensing. This is not standard terminology. I need a name. I just made it up for this talk. This is the case where you have deflections by large angles, radians, many radians. You can have many, many images, numerous images. And all this can happen near a black hole. So that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Let's go back to Einstein's linear, linearized gravity deflection formula. If I have a mass M, and I send a ray of light at some impact parameter Xi, the deflection angle is 4gm over C squared Xi. And this is all that we need to understand standard weak lensing, strong lensing, et cetera. Maybe slightly generalize this through a Newtonian potential, but other than that, this is it. This does show that as the ray comes closer and closer to the center, that is Xi gets smaller, alpha will increase, so deflection angle keeps increasing. But if you come close enough, this formula is no longer accurate. You have to do the full general relativistic calculation. This, of course, can be done and people have done it. And what one then finds is, if you come close enough to a sufficiently compact object, and I'm only going to think of a black hole here, you can come to a radius where a ray of light can be deflected all the way around the black hole. So the deflection is so large, if I send a ray tangentially out here, it keeps bending round and round and comes back to the starting place. So you can have a whole orbit of a black hole. It's no longer a small deflection, it's a large deflection. In fact, if you can keep it perfectly on this orbit, you can get a deflection of infinity, infinite number of orbits, each with a deflection of two pi. For a non-spinning, i.e. Schwarzschild black hole, this orbit is at a radius of 3 gm over c squared, which is not the horizon. Let me remind you, this is outside the horizon. Horizon is at 2 gm over c squared. And in fact, for spinning black holes, the event horizon is even smaller in the appropriate coordinates. I'm talking about Schwarzschild or boyer lindquist coordinates. So one thing is clear, if you've got such large deviations, and if you look at an object or you look at radiation that's coming from close to a black hole, what you see is going to be highly distorted. So what will this image look like? This is a, you know, it's an interesting question. Many people have thought about it and uh, looked at it. And now, in fact, we can actually observe and test some of the predictions that people have made. So 
what i'm going to show here this is just a a, a pretty movie just you know it'll keep going while i'm running uh, while i'm talking black holes are not black many black holes in the universe actually shine and we can see radiation from them and we see this radiation because black holes have what are called accretion disks around them gas gas flows in from outside towards the black hole usually in some kind of an orbit orbiting structure it's called the disk accretion disk you know this movie is a, is a simulation of one of these disks you know this is what we think some of these systems might look like highly turbulent it's actually orbiting around the black hole so the orbital uh, plane normal is in the vertical direction the horizontal is the plane of the orbit here the right hand side shows the density in this movie the left hand side shows something to do with the radiation none of the details matter it's just a pretty movie which my postdoc made so i like to show it um but the point is there is radiation being produced all over this place including you know right next to the horizon a little bit of even that near horizon radiation is likely to escape and we will see all of this radiation however we won't see the picture that i'm showing you on the screen because this is a picture in local black hole coordinate actually this is in bauer lindquist a short shield coordinates what you see will be a distorted picture and is distorted because the radiation that emanates from here has to go round the black hole get deflected by large angles and reach you so what would you actually see so here is for instance a movie this is now a movie of what you expect to see in the sky this is from my student andrew shale and for a short shield i think this movie is actually for a spinning black hole but let's think still in terms of a short shield black hole if you got this turbulent gas going round and radiating away you will get radiation from all of the turbulent uh, orbiting gas but it all gets pushed away from the center you will see a dark center because from there the radiation cannot reach you the only way you get radiation is off to the side and then reaching you and if you had infinite angular resolution and infinite time resolution as well according to andrew this is something like what you might expect and he made this particular movie for a famous black hole the one in m87 galaxy it's called m87 star and this is a movie at 1.3 millimeters which is a wavelength where you can actually go and observe this so as i said infinite resolution so you've got a primary image which is all of this you know spiral structure which is showing the orbiting gas etc you also see the sharp ring like feature those are additional images i'm going to say more about these additional images so you know this is an example of many many images of the same uh, or radiating source and these multiple images they have a very characteristic size for a short shield black hole that linear size is 6 root 3 gm over c squared which for this black hole is 40 micro arc seconds and this overall phenomenon of a dark center and a bright ring is called the shadow of the black hole this was predicted by falke et al in 2000 okay so can you actually go and look for this when they came up with that prediction they didn't have really a, a technique to do it but the technique actually was developed in the last 20 years this is done through very long baseline interferometry um vlbi the technique is to put telescopes let me tell you how this is done you have telescopes all over the earth say in france and spain and the south pole in chile and mexico usa greenland etc hawaii you know you have all these telescopes and you treat it like a telescope that's as big as the earth except you only collect signal at these very special points then you go and do some magic on the computer you correlate these signals and the end of the day if you do it all properly you can get image information with an angular resolution as if you had a telescope as big as the earth and as you know the angular resolution of a telescope goes like wavelength divided by the diameter of your telescope so having something as big as the earth gives you very you know ability to resolve very small angles 
And for this particular experiment at one millimeter, you can get an angular resolution of 20 microseconds, which is you know, good enough. You won't see all the fine details, but you'll at least see the gross structure predicted by theory because the expected diameter is 40 microseconds. So this is the famous event horizon telescope experiment. The data were collected in 2017 and the first results were published in 2019. And I think many of you must have seen this uh, image. This is the image, April 2019. This is the image that the Event Horizon Telescope observed from M87 at 1.3 millimeters. And it's exactly the way it was predicted to look. For this angular resolution, you cannot really make out all those sharp, ring-like you know, features. You need to do better experiments for that. But the overall shape is absolutely bang on what one predicts. Dark center, a ring-like uh, distribution, which is a combination of multiple images. And I'll talk about the multiple images in a second. And the diameter, which I told you is six root three GM over C squared, is a handle on the mass of this black hole. I won't uh, dwell on what that particular experiment uh, implies. It's a lot of good astrophysics. I think for our purposes here, it's a wonderful prediction of a major, you know, wonderful confirmation of a major prediction, ultra strong gravitational lensing close to a black hole, deflections by radium or radians. And quantitatively, having measured the diameter, you can now say what's the mass of the black hole turns out to be 6.5, 10 to the nine solar masks. That's about all I'm going to say about that image. But now let's talk about how many images are there. Okay, so you've got radiating gas close to a black hole. So this is now my picture of a black hole. The black circle is the horizon. The dotted circle is this photon orbit. So for a non-spinning black hole, that is at three GM over C squared. And let's suppose among all of this you know, turbulent gas, I just focus on one little piece of gas, which is radiating. This guy is radiating in all directions. One ray, the blue ray, would go like this, get deflected modestly by the black hole, and it'll go off towards the observer. The observer is off to the right at some infinite distance. That's one image, that's the primary image. That's the one that's actually showing all those spiral patterns and all of that, you know, the lovely structure in Andrew's movie. Here's another ray. It goes off in this direction. It gets deflected by maybe close to pi by two, then goes off in the right direction and of course reaches the observer. So the observer will see a second copy of this guy in this picture above the black hole, whereas the first one was below the black hole. But then there are more images. The green guy goes in, goes just outside the photon orbit, makes a circle, comes out. That's the third image. And then there's a fourth image. The red curve can do the opposite direction, can go off. And in fact, technically, you have an infinite number of images on each side, here and there. And I'm not going to tell you whether it's an odd or even number of images. I think infinity is both. Uh, but anyway, it's many, many, many images, and pretty much all the images experience large deflections. This is what I'm going to call ultra strong gravitational lens. Now, we have seen, I mean, you can also see all of these rays, they leave a hole in the middle, right? You don't see any rays coming out in this direction. They get piled up either on this side or on that side. And that's, in fact, what the M87 image is showing stuff piled up on this side and that side. In fact, they're piled up all around the black hole. And it's just you know, a confirmation of what you might expect. I'm going to go into more detail on the images. So Spenta, just stop me if I, I'm going too long, but this is kind of nice stuff I'm just going to keep explaining. So this is a, a video. I've just borrowed this from my colleague, Michael Johnson. So think of this picture here in the bottom as one still from that movie I showed, Andrew Shea. You know, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm going to break it down into all the different rays in this video. 
So if I press this, it should start. Yeah, there it is. So I'm just showing two rays here. So there's one ray that started from the bottom here, went around the black hole and goes off towards the observer. Another one that did this. Both of these rays started on the far side of the black hole. You know, I'm the observer out here. They started off somewhere on the far side of the black hole. Then they crossed the black hole plane and they reached me. These I'm going to call as the n equal to zero, kind of the primary rays. So you'll see a whole lot of these guys in this movie. So, you know, many, many rays, they come, some are deflected more, some are deflected less. They all add up to one image here. This is my n equal to zero image. This is the picture of the whole accretion disk distorted by the black hole. You know, I see kind of, you know, all of the turbulent spiral structure and all that good stuff. That's this fellow. Now I'm going to show another set of rays. Here, these are rays that actually start in front of the black hole. From the observer, there's a black hole. These are rays that are starting from the front of the black hole. They go around and then reach the observer. Again, we look at a whole series of these rays. These fellows will all join together. This is the second image of all the radiating elements. And you can see this is a much sharper feature. It's sharper because you know they're all now getting close to the photon orbit. They don't have too much uh, freedom to move around in angle space. So I get a sharp image. And the size of this image is now mostly reflecting space time, much less of the astrophysics. It's a nice handle on the space time. So this is n equal to one. Let's continue on. Now you'll see some rays that uh, start again from the far side, but they now go fully around the black hole. They cross this plane twice before reaching the observer. That's why they're called n equal to two. And these will all add up to yet another ring, which is in fact even sharper. It's actually dimmer, that's the bad news, but it's a hell of a lot sharper. It's like exponentially sharper than the other guy. So finally, when I add up all of the rays, and you can imagine infinite sequence of these nested rays, I get the final image that I showed earlier, n equal to zero spread out, n equal to one sharp, n equal to two even sharper, and going all the way across. It would be lovely to see these multiple images and actually resolve them. The only way to do this is by going to space. Even with telescopes spread across the earth, there's a limit to the resolution. And you saw the limit that one reached. At least at this wavelength, all you can do is get, get a smeared image. But if you could send one telescope into space, let's say as far as the moon, or even the L2 point, you can get a lot more angular resolution. So for instance, something like this is feasible with enough money and putting a big enough telescope out in space. So, you know, you had both ground and space, you can see everything. You can see both the spread out structure, all the astrophysics, and you can see the gravitational physics, the space time structure through these sharp features. What would we expect to see? So let me keep uh, hurrying up here. I'm going to show a picture from Johnson's paper, the a cross section. What does intensity look like if I made a cut across this ring at a couple of places. So this is what you would see. This is a cut in the vicinity of this photon ring of intensity versus impact parameter. And what you see is this is the zero order, n equal to zero image. That's a spread out thing. Spreads over a fairly wide range of angles. This is the first n equal to one ring. It's a more compact feature. It's actually kind of somewhat brighter than the n equal to zero, but it's compact in angle. n equal to two is actually modestly brighter than n equal to one, but it's much sharper, much thinner. n equal to three is you know, awfully thin. You can't even resolve it in this stretched out image. So basically all these successive images, they have pretty good intensity. Assuming the object is transparent, I'm not going to go into those details. They have pretty good intensity, but they have very little flux because they become exponentially sharper in radial extent. 
So that looks like bad news. You know, how are you going to, you know, even if you had the angular resolution, if there's hardly any flux there, how will you even make out that this object has these sharp features? Those who do interferometry actually are not that concerned. There's a beauty of interferometry that if you use a long baseline, two telescopes well separated, which gives you high angular resolution, at the same time, I mean, it gives you the angular resolution, but at the same time, it also filters out any structures on smoother scales, i.e., if I had an interferometer that has the capacity to resolve this feature, n equal to three or n equal to two, let us say, automatically it filters out the n equal to one and n equal to zero. That is to say, that's gone. You have so much resolution that this looks essentially like there's nothing there. And you're able to focus in on just the feature you want to study by doing it for a minute. And a nice, I think you should all go and just read the Johnson et al. paper. It's really beautiful. It's a lovely idea. And the, basically the bottom line is, if you had the right baseline and some sensitivity, you do need sensitivity, you could in fact separate out these multiple images, at least up to n equal to one and probably n equal to two, and study their properties. And actually therefore study the geometry of space-time around the black hole in M87, and ultimately we hope around the black hole in our own galaxy. So this picture shows some additional details like what you would gain by putting a telescope on the moon or ELTO or a geostationary orbit. You know, there's all lots of interesting stuff, what you can do for different distances. I will ignore that. I'll just mention two more points and then I will stop. One is, okay, let's go back to this picture. There is a piece of radiating material here. It's producing multiple images. Let's imagine that this radiating element is variable. I.e. it's not a steady source, but fluctuates up and down in time. Now, just from the picture, it should be clear that if this thing suddenly became brighter, the observer will see the different images get brighter but not all at the same time. This one has the shortest distance to travel. So this is the one that will go up first. It's also, of course, the brightest image. This guy will be the next guy to vary. It's, it's, you know, it's a dimmer, but it will vary with a distinct time delay. And each of these successive images will come at a later and later time, because they are extremely dim as you go to higher order, but they are there, they're distinctly separated in time. And in principle, you should be able to see these echoes echoes of the primary fluctuation in a time signal of the object. That's something that I think, you know, in principle should be doable, assuming the object varies on a rapid enough time scale. It should vary on a time scale that is shorter than the time delays between the objects. And you can calculate the time delays. It's about 30 GM over C squared, C cubed. That's roughly the time. So if our sources cooperate, this is something that one could do. One other signature, there is polarization. The emission that comes from the accretion flow is not just a scalar intensity. It has got polarization at, as, associated with it. In fact, it's synchrotron radiation it can be highly polarized. In fact, we have already seen polarization from M87. This was published just last month. Uh, this is the, just shows the electric vector of the linear polarization in the image of M87. And you can see this beautiful pattern here. And it says interesting things about the magnetic field in the source. I won't go into that. Here, I just want to point out, once again, what we are observing is a combination of multiple images. This is the net polarization that our low angular resolution telescope observed. If we had higher angular resolution, we would be able to see what does the n equal to zero image look like in polarization? What does the n equal to one, n equal to two, et cetera? How are different are they? Do they all have the same polarization or not? Narsima mentioned yesterday in his talk that you know when you've got two quasars images and let us say they're polarized for whatever reason, they should have the same polarization orientation in the sky, even though they're getting deflected and all that polarization 
orientation should be the same. Well, that's no longer true for ultra strong gravity. You know, if I look at the rays, this ray is taking off in this direction. So whatever the polarization state was emitted here is what I'm going to see after it has been deflected, the Fermi you know, Walker transport you have to do to calculate. This guy goes off in a completely different direction, turns around and then reaches us. And in fact, the polarization states of these multiple images will not be the same. You can actually calculate, predict all these things for toy models. And we, we can get quite different polarizations, but all predictable. And in fact, once you've got two images, you can predict what all the rest should do. They kind of flip flop and all. There's lots of nice, interesting work already done and much more to be done. Again, with a space telescope and with polarization capabilities, in principle, I think one should be able to do this and will be yet another way to explore the space time. It's all very futuristic, but I think we made the first step using these Earth-based uh, baselines. This is, I think, the new frontier. So let me stop at this point. I think I've taken too much time. From my point of view, Chitre started me on gravitational lensing. His talk triggered an interest. And then I went and studied the literature, kept saying, oh my God, these three IFR guys are so smart. Their models were always correct. But anyway, I yeah, started doing my own stuff and went on for about 10 years or so. I'm grateful to him, part of his legacy, I think. Of course, he was also a friend, known him for many years since then. Um, all I can say is, you know, I will miss him, and I'm sure everybody else here will also miss him, but he was a great scientist. And most of all, as I said, he had that uh, knack, not just to explain, but to leave a little bit unexplained so that people would go and start thinking more about it. Instead of saying, okay, now I understand, let me do something else. I actually went off and had to think and ask myself, why is this thing true? And that started me off on a very interesting journey. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an exciting talk. Uh, there is one. Should I stop sharing, Spenta? Or... No, it's okay. Actually, there is a okay. question, actually, which is so long that I will request uh, the person who has asked the question to ask it. His name is Vil Badra from Philadelphia. Vil Badra himself. Okay. <laughs> Please go ahead. Good morning. Professor Narayan, uh, yes, I feel reading your papers, I learn whatever lensing I know, I know from your writings. So my question is that um, even Horizon Telescope astronomers claim that they have confirmed black holes. But even if that object has smallest amount of a scalar charge, for example, uh, what happens that any, uh, any uh, even naked singularity covered inside photon sphere and a black hole both have completely same qualitative features. Then image numbers, etc. everything is same, only quantitatively they're different, but 10 to the power minus 20, which is can be easily absorbed in mass term. So what I wanted to say that at most we can say that what they have observed is either weakly naked singularity. Weakly naked singularities are those which are covered at least inside one photon sphere. So weakly naked and singularity and a, a black hole both resemble very much. Only a strongly naked singularity, which me and George Ellis uh, classified, a strongly naked singularity are not covered by any photon sphere and they have negative time delay number of images could be four, as you mentioned in the beginning, even number, etc. So, so long the naked singularity is, um, is weakly naked, covered inside a photon surface, we cannot say it is black hole. It could be weakly naked singularity. You are absolutely right. Event Horizon Telescope has not proved that M87 is a black hole. All we can say is there is a photon sphere or a photon orbit that is required to make the image that you know that we observe. But that is all, it's, you know, it's not the horizon. So it's not a horizon. You can't say anything about a singularity in the middle, but we can say that there is a radius or a, a zone 
where photons can go round and round the black hole. That's really all that it has done. So, you know, the name Event Horizon Telescope, it's great, it's catchy, but really it is the photon orbit or photon shell telescope. Yeah. Any inference? Say, yeah, yeah go ahead. I would say photon hole rather than black hole. Thank you. Yeah, but you know, um, will you get uh, funding if you say I want to go and look at the photon hole? So you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for the people who built the. You know, I am part of the team, but I'm not the one who you know put 20 years into building the technology and making it all work. Shep Doleman, my colleague, he's the one who gets the you know the bulk of the credit for actually doing this. Um, but yeah, so anyway, he's the one who came up with the name. So, okay, let's call it photon hole or event horizon telescope or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yes. Um, but I agree with you. Any object that can have a photon sphere around it will have pretty much the same image. So it could be a black hole. It could be a, what you call a weak uh, naked singularity. In fact, I know your papers on that with Ellis and uh, we ourselves did a few models Again, with TIFR, this was with Pankaj Joshi and uh, collaborators um, on uh, naked singularity models. And we do see the difference between the weak and the strong naked singularities. And you cannot tell the difference as far as the image goes. It could also in principle be an object with a surface which is inside the photon shell. Doesn't even have to be um, singular so long as that surface does not radiate. So, you know, we can go into this a lot, but I, I completely accept the, the, the points you are making. Yeah, and most surprising we'll find that uh, we say that uh, uh, lensing is a cosmic telescope. What we find that naked singularities are better cosmic telescope for two reasons. When you calculate the total absolute magnification of images, naked singularity gives more total absolute magnification. And time delay is also less for naked singularity. So it brings information better than the black holes or normal objects. So I would say that naked singularities are not naked, just naked for themselves, but naked singularity make the inverse more naked, means more visible to us. So it is a better cosmic telescope than other objects. That's wonderful, yeah. The only question is, do we have naked singularities? You know, Roger Penrose mentioned <laughs> right, right, about the, right, the cosmic cosmic uh, censorship, still unproven. It's a conjecture, but like he said, kind of everybody's intuition is that if you look for a sufficiently generic, stable uh, configuration, you probably won't find naked singularity. You can make them very easily with uh, spherical symmetry, which is the model you were talking about. We have or even bang. without, okay, Big yeah, bang. you can do it with the uh, symmetries, but completely without symmetry. Yeah. Um, nobody has yet, as, as far as anybody knows, made one. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there is uh, one more question, one last question, if you don't mind, Ramesh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Could you, uh, here is a question from Kaustup Gupta. Could you please comment on the new updated image of the M87 black hole released by the EHT collaboration? Does it reveal any new physics about the black holes or verify any old physics? That's the question. This is the picture I think you're talking about. This is what came out just a couple of months ago. Um, I would say in terms of black hole physics, this hasn't added much. It still shows a shadow and a ring and all of that. The, the information we're getting here from the polarization is telling us a lot about the magnetic field in the accreting, accreting gas. You know, the gas that's accreting is a magnetized plasma and the radiation that comes out of that plasma, which is synchrotron radiation, reflects the orientation of the magnetic field so from this polarization pattern, which I am showing in this picture, you can say something about the magnetic field at the origin. So very roughly speaking, the magnetic field projected on the sky should be perpendicular to the polarization direction. So field lines projected probably are doing this, if you can see my uh, cursor. 
So that's really astrophysics. They're asking, what did it tell us about gravitational physics? Not much yet. If we could resolve the individual images, as I mentioned, and we started studying how the polarization flips between images on one side and the other and the multiple images, et cetera, that would be quite useful, I think, in checking, you know, whether is this a curve metric or not? Who, I mean, we don't know. Is it a black hole? Um, or is it one of Virabhadra's uh, naked singularity? Uh, that could be done, but at the moment, I don't think we have done it yet. Okay. Thank you, Ramesh. And thank you for a wonderful talk. And I think uh, this is a good time to end the session. Thank you to all the participants and the organizers for this uh, wonderful evening session, including all the speakers. Ramesh, Abhay, and uh, Roger. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Gaudiya. So uh, before, uh, so we will see all of you tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, before people start leaving, I would like to invite all of you to uh, speaker and audience alike to stay back and uh, continue the interaction if there are any questions or 